Today, I am joined by my colleagues for a hearing on docket number 1169, order for a hearing regarding dockless mobility and electric scooters in the city of Boston, sponsored by my colleague and friend, Councilor Matt O'Malley. In addition to the sponsor, we are also joined by District Councilor Ed Flynn and District Councilor Josh Zakum, and I'm sure others will walk in uh, as we go along. We have three panels uh, set up for today. We'll hear first from administration, uh, administration representatives and then from some uh, folks in industry related to dockless mobility and then from advocates. Uh, but we also are trying to get, at least in this committee, trying to get in more of a habit of interspersing public testimony throughout so that folks who are generously sharing their time with us from the public don't have to wait until several hours in after Q&A. Um, so right now it looks like there's only one person signed up to testify who will not be on one of the panels later. Um, so I'd like to invite up Michael Messina. Um, if, if Michael would like to start us off with some public testimony and then we'll move into panel one. If anyone feels moved, continue to sign up to testify. We'll do another round of public testimony before between each of the panels. Uh, yes. Um, wasn't expecting to come up right away, so I'll be brief. Um, uh, good to see you again, Councillor Flynn. Um, we'd spoken about electric scooters at uh, my neighborhood association meeting um, on Tuesday. Um, I would just, you know, I'm here just to say that I would like Boston to have electric scooters. I think that personally, it would make my commutes. Um, I live in the South End. It would make my commute to Back Bay a lot easier. I know I have a, I have a lot of friends. Uh, who take a lot of lifts and Ubers, and they you know, talk about how, oh, yeah, I don't want to go to your house. I don't want to take the tea to your house, because then I'd have to walk like eight minutes. They're a little lazier than I am, and I know that they would use these if available. Um, and uh, just to Councillor Wu, I follow you on Twitter. Um, I know you read the most recent UN climate report. Um, I was very encouraged what you had to say about how cities have to take the lead, especially Boston, in fighting climate change. Um, and to me, that this is one of the easiest steps we can take. Um, these are electric, they're not cars, they'll take millions of um, miles uh, of car trips off the road, um, and we don't have to pay for it. Um, companies will come in and just put them on our streets, and it's the easiest step we can take to fight climate change, and if we can't do this, I'll be pretty disheartened, um, but that's what I have to say. Thank you very much. Uh, so again, if anyone else wishes to testify, please continue to sign up. Now we'll move into the formal um, Q&A and, and panel discussion. So I'd like to open it up first to the lead sponsor, Councilor Matt O'Malley. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you all for attending today's hearing on dockless micromobility and permitting electric scooters here in our city of Boston. I'm excited to explore all angles of this rapidly evolving field with you. The field is so new that it's popular, popularized a new term, micro-mobility, which refers to a category of small vehicles for shorter, more flexible trips around the city. While electric scooters and other forms of dockless micro-mobility are new, transportation innovation driven by resident demand and the challenges and opportunities that these innovations create for cities are not new. Debates over how to share our streets with automobiles and bicycles occupied municipal leaders 100 years ago, and perhaps 100 years from now, some new one, some, someone will compare what we discuss today as a form of transportation that none of us can imagine. Even reaching, into, even reaching into recent history, the advocates in this room can remember the concerns and controversy surrounding Blue Bikes when it was first proposed almost a decade ago. After Blue Bikes, then Hubway, were deployed, Boston has never been able to keep up with the demand for this new and exciting way to get around. While the complaint at first was about the role Blue Bikes would play on our streets and sidewalks, now the most common complaint I hear is from residents who don't yet have Blue Bikes in their community, and they're looking forward to its expansion. I personally am very excited that Blue Bikes will be part of West Roxbury, uh, hopefully within the next month or so. I'm looking at the chief who is nodding his head. Um, I'm especially excited for that station. I'm pleased that we will be running as ecumenical a process as humanly possible. After this panel, we've invited uh, at least four of the private industry folks who will be offering um, us some perspective on what they've done in uh, cities uh, around the United States. And after that, we're going to hear from some advocates who have a vested stake in this as well. 
Boston has long been known as a city that innovates. We've been early adopters of every transportation innovation in America, from the first subway at Park Street to one of the earliest bike shares in the country. At the same time, our city has great challenges. In Harvard's recent Equality of Opportunity study, Boston was on a list of places with the longest commute times for low-income residents. In this study, commuting time was the single strongest contributor to a family's chances of escaping poverty. It mattered more than crime or test scores. This should remind us why we must pursue transportation equity for all of our residents. Each new innovation will bring difficulties and adjustment. I'm particularly curious to learn today about how new ways of getting around can integrate with our streetscapes, remain safe, and take into account the mobility needs of Bostonians with disabilities. As Boston has led on so many revolutions, we can also be one of the first cities to get the shared mobility revolution right for all of our residents. I hope we can start that work here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor O'Malley. Councillor Flynn. Thank you, Councillor Wu, and um, thank you to Councillor O'Malley and to Councillor Wu for your leadership on, on this issue and, and many other issues um, in our city. Um, my primary focus on this issue and all things really relating to um, pedestrian safety, transportation, public safety, is how are we going to communicate? How does the city administration, the city council, public transportation, um, how can we work together to ensure public safety is at the forefront of any policy decision that we make, whether it's a pilot or it's policy? We have to make sure we have a system, a transportation system, that is safe, reliable, and equitable. They will have to, if, if we look at a pilot plan, we want to make sure that we have the legal requirements um, outlined first. Um, you know, how, thinking out loud, what, what will the speed limits be for some of these scooters? Um, will people wear helmets? Will they, will they be able to drive on the sidewalks? Um, what is the minimum age requirement? Will there be some, some sort of license or registration with the City of Boston Transportation Department? We have a lot of safety concerns. I'm not opposed to this idea, but we do have a lot of safety concerns impacting many neighborhoods across our city. In my neighborhood of, of South Boston, um, you know, cars are speeding at, at great, great lengths. Um, and how will this impact um, scooters on L Street or on East 4th Street or East 5th Street? What will the rules of the road be? Um, with all the crashes affecting pedestrians, motorists, and cyclists we have seen, um, you know, what will the impact be on Vision Zero? No fatal or serious crashes in our city. Now, I understand, as I mentioned, the appeal of electronic scooters, and I'm not opposed to it. They're an interesting idea to try to help alleviate some of the congestion and traffic we see in our city and region, or, redu or reduce the emissions and pollution that come from vehicles that contribute to climate change and sea level rises. Those are issues that Councillor Wu and Councillor O'Malley and the city administration have been working on for a lot of years um, effectively. But we also must work out other quality of life issues as well. There are a lot of details we need to work on as a city when it comes to this issue, but it's a conversation certainly worth having. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Uh, before I move to Councillor Zagam, I do want to note that Councillor Janey and Councillor Sabi George have joined us. Thank you. And now, Councillor Josh Sakem. Uh, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I want to be very uh, brief here because I know there's a lot to talk about. Uh, this seems like a great idea, and I want to thank Councillor O'Malley for being proactive uh, on bringing this before this body so that we can get ahead of it. As when my first year on this body about six years ago, uh, we were chasing the, uh, the ride-sharing uh, industry for a little bit of time to try and figure out the best way to make that work in the city of Boston. So it's good to be proactive here. I want to see this work. Um, my main concerns about this, and I look forward, I, I may have to step out early, I have another engagement, but um, if folks representing the industry might weigh in, um, either by written testimony or not, on what their plans are and how they address issues of accessibility and where these vehicles are going to be left. Um, it's certainly an issue across the city of Boston, but in the neighborhoods I represent, particularly in Beacon Hill, in the Back Bay, we have very 
crowded sidewalks, which is good because a lot of people are there uh, patronizing our establishments, going to events, that sort of thing. But it can be challenging for people with mobility impairments. Uh, it can be challenging for people without um, to get across, particularly on Newberry Street, and we've been back and forth on uh, sandwich boards uh, on Newberry Street and the fact that those uh, provide some sort of impediments. So um, I would just say that for my peace of mind um, and for hearing how this is going to work in the city of Boston, um, what the sort of staffing plans are um, for the folks in the industry. Uh, in other cities, have they assigned maybe a full-time person to some of these high traffic areas to make sure that their vehicles are not blocking the pathway and what the interaction is going to be with our parking enforcement officers uh, at BTD? Um, I think that's very important. I think this is innovative. I think it goes directly to addressing issues of climate, uh, of traffic, of uh, safety um, in the city of Boston. I want to see this work, but we cannot uh, forget that there are folks who do have, who it's not as easy for them to get around our city already, um, and we need to make sure that we're not putting more barriers in their path. Um, so that's uh, what I look forward to hearing more about, and I want to uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilor Zakem. Councilor Janey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge and thank Councilor Matt O'Malley for introducing uh, this hearing order. Um, I'm someone who believes deeply in making sure that we have equitable uh, transit opportunities. I uh, rely on public transportation primarily. I do not own a car. And so making sure that we are sharing our roads uh, with people who walk, people who have to take the T, uh, people who bike, and cars, very important to me. So um, I, can, I share the concerns that um, Councilor Flynn raised around safety, but I also want to just kind of elevate uh, equity as being an important uh, piece of my consideration as I think about this uh, for the residents in my district. I recently had the opportunity to visit Seattle and they seem to be kind of ahead of the game in terms of uh, making sure that their roads are shared. They actually have uh, traffic signals for the cyclists. I mean, it was very exciting there. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, in this hearing, just hearing uh, from the panelists to, to think about what uh, the options are for us here in Boston and particularly interested in hearing from uh, advocates and those who are attending the hearing. So um, thank you and um, look forward to a good discussion. Thank you, Councillor Janey. We're also joined by Councillor Edwards today. And now Councillor Anissa Osabi-George. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you to the maker for bringing us all here in a very proactive way. Excited to hear about the, um, the way that we can support uh, the changing uh, modes of transportation in the city of Boston and how we can make sure that they are accessible, that they are safe, um, that they're used responsibly and then stored responsibly, and excited about uh, hearing from not just our, the administration but also from the advocates on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sabi George. Councillor Edwards. All right, we'll proceed with our administration panel. Um, uh, you all know the drill, and we, I see we have a lot of experts uh, <laughs> to back you up as well. Uh, so feel free to make an opening statement. Please introduce yourself. Maybe start with Chief Osgood. Sure, uh, I'm Chris Osgood. Uh, I am joined here by uh, Commissioner McCosh, who will also be making uh, potentially some brief opening remarks, as well as Commissioner Fiendaka and our uh, Active Transportation Director, Stephanie Seskin. Um, I am gonna uh, really offer some very brief remarks kind of in three areas, one about micromobility in general, second, sort of about what is our, uh, I think, our really most successful shared micromobility uh, project in the city and in the region, which is the Blue Bike Program, and then sort of talk a little bit more about e-scooters in general. Um, in terms of micromobility, you know, certainly the, uh, the four of us and the administration, you know, overwhelmingly agrees with many of these opening statements. Um, we think that we have huge transportation uh, challenges and opportunities in front of us. Um, and given some of the priorities, which many of you mentioned, and priorities that are, uh, that are really at the top for the mayor, um, how we sort of manage growth in the city of Boston, how we close um, the equity gaps we have in our city, um, how we think about reducing emissions uh, and becoming a more resilient city and a more resilient region, we know that we need to move in ways that cause less congestion, that cost less for our constituents, and that result in fewer emissions. That is absolutely core, and that is why so much of the work that we are doing in the administration is about encouraging active transportation and shared transportation, walking, biking, mass transit. Uh, and there's a way in which micromobility, uh, that shared micromobility, can really play into uh, exactly that. Um, in the short term, obviously, a lot of the work that all of us have been talking about have been things like 
uh, improving our, our bike network in the city of Boston, expanding our investment in sidewalks, piloting things like, uh, like bus lanes. Um, but to your point, Councillor O'Malley, we want to stay on the cusp of what is innovative because we know that the big challenges we face really require embracing new solutions. Uh, and so um, we have, uh, with that in mind, we are creating a new mobility position, as we've spoken about before, uh, within the Boston Transportation Department, where we'll have a transportation planner who we will be hiring, who's going to be focusing specifically on how we create frameworks for experimenting with new mobility, micro-mobility uh, projects. Um, we expect to have that person on board by the end of this year, and that is one of the positions which was uh, funded essentially through the change in parking fines, which all of you supported. And again, we appreciate your support for that. Um, that person will help uh, play a role of guiding innovation, um, of helping us, guiding innovations not just in general and not just being sort of in a, a uh, sort of a laboratory, but a laboratory that helps us achieve the fundamental objectives all of you um, articulated, actually moving people in ways that uh, are better for our environment, that are safer on our streets, uh, and that really result in the sort of city all of our constituents most want. Um, that person is also going to be tasked with thinking about how new mobility really integrates with the existing systems we have, most uh, notably the MBTA and the Blue Bike uh, program that we have. Thinking of Blue Bikes, again, uh, this is really the um, sort of the keystone uh, sort of micromobility project uh, in our region. Uh, it is the fourth largest, and Stephanie can correct me on that, or Gina can correct me on that, the fourth largest um, bike share program uh, in the nation. Uh, and that was as of 2017 and 2018, we've been breaking every single record uh, we've had for bike share. Uh, we're up to 1.5 million rides, I believe, so far uh, in 2018. Um, bike share in Boston and the Blue Bike program, um, we think works incredibly well because it meets so many of the things which each of you touched on. Uh, it is a program that is delivering quality bikes that are affordably priced, that are equitably distributed, so it allows us to actually be able to connect people uh, in great ways, whether it is a commute from the south end to the back bay or it's a commute uh, from uh, their home to, uh, to a major subway line or a key bus route in our city. Uh, expanding that program and supporting that program is a key objective for this administration, which is why by 2019 we expect to have 300 stations, 3,000 bikes um, across the four participating municipalities, uh, Boston, Brookline, Cambridge, and Somerville. Uh, and it's a great example not just of a, an effective micromobility program, but an effective uh, regional micromobility program, one that is working well across borders, uh, and one that sort of gives us a template that we can use as we think about what's ahead. Um, obviously, what is also ahead are the two devices that are over my right shoulder, um, uh, which are the uh, e-scooters, um, and that is why uh, we are putting together a, essentially a, a regional framework uh, that would allow for um, the piloting of e-scooters uh, on our streets as soon as the spring of 2019. Um, we are doing that, uh, again, sort of with those core tenants in mind of can we create a program that allows us to pilot this, that helps us meet the safety objectives that you touched on, that allows for e-scooters to be uh, accessible throughout the entire city of Boston, uh, that they can be affordably priced and that they can be safe for all road users. Um, these are obviously the things which are the principles that, uh, that we share um, as, uh, uh, in this. And I would say that as we, as we build this regional framework, as we build this sort of uh, this pilot program that, again, we would look to uh, institute in 2019, I would just want to flag, as all of you know, there is one significant uh, uh, sort of statewide hurdle, and that is the Massachusetts General Law, that the Massachusetts General Law currently defines e-scooters as motorized scooters. And that motorized scooters, in order to comply with the Massachusetts General Law, have to have things like brake lights and turn signals. Uh, they have to operate only between sunrise and sunset, that the riders have to have uh, helmets. Um, and that uh, these are things which are obviously all done in the name of safety, uh, and that if uh, the vehicle types, if they, if they do not meet Massachusetts general law, uh, it's not something which we would be able to permit uh, on, our, on our roads. Um, that said, um, as we think about this regional framework, um, those fundamental objectives that all of you have touched on are the things which we are thinking about um, in an, the pilot program that we'd create. Um, how do we make sure that uh, e-scooters on our streets were actually accessible uh, in every neighborhood in the city of Boston, uh, that they actually really reinforced first last mile connections uh, between neighborhoods and mass transit or some of the cross neighborhood connections uh, that mass transit might not be able to serve that well uh, as uh, Michael touched on in the beginning uh, between neighborhoods that may not be directly served by uh, sort of a bus route or a subway line that, uh, that meets a particular constituent's needs. Uh, how do we make sure, uh, frankly, that uh, E-scooters on our streets, and in particular on our sidewalks, are stored in such a way that they are actually uh, not a, uh, not only not an impediment, but actually uh, can improve or uh, can 
maintain a high quality public realm and an accessible path of travel um, for everybody who's on our sidewalks. Um, we wanna make sure that everybody who's on our sidewalks um, is able to, uh, to navigate uh, easily uh, throughout our entire city and that is sort of a highest priority uh, for us. Uh, and then as we think about um, the use of these vehicles um, on our roadways, how do we make sure that they are done in a way that uphold um, that which frankly all of us have been talking about more than anything else, which is our objective to have zero fatalities on our roads uh, and to reduce the number of crashes overall in city streets. Um, so there's some work ahead of us over the course of this fall and this winter to, uh, to frame out uh, this, uh, what pilot, this pilot program and how, what it would look like, uh, again, with an eye towards the spring of 2019. Uh, and we look forward to engaging in that conversation with all of you and appreciate the fact that you've called this hearing, which allows for all of us to be able to hear from the participating companies uh, as well as uh, the advocates and constituents uh, on this issue. Um, if Commissioner Mikosh has any uh, opening remarks, I'll turn it over to her and then we'll open for questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Councilors, for allowing me to speak here today. As the city's disability commissioner, I work closely with the other departments here to ensure accessibility in all of the city's programs, policies, infrastructure, you name it, we have to make sure it's accessible. So we work together every day, not only to maintain the quality of life for Boston residents, but really to improve it. Boston's home to over 80,000 residents with disabilities and tens of thousands more commuters, visitors, and tourists come into our city who have disabilities every day. One of our biggest shared priorities is to maintain the unobstructed path of travel on the city sidewalks. We collaborated with stakeholders, state agencies, nonprofits, and community groups for a period of over four years to develop an optimal, equitable set of standards for construction of sidewalks called Complete Streets. This is fully Im implemented now by the Public Works Department and adhered to by the Boston Transportation Department. In, this, in these guidelines, th we're required to provide an unobstructed path of travel. Because transit isn't always accessible, sidewalks are the most common mode of travel for people with disabilities. Everybody can use a sidewalk and it's free. We see obstructions all the time, but as a city, we can mitigate most of these because usually the work's done by public works, BTD, or contractors who are under our auspices. We can control this work and make sure that we maintain the path of travel. One of our concerns with the dockless bikes is that they're owned by a private company. We need to partner with them moving forward so that we can ensure that the path of travel remains unobstructed. They can be left in the middle of the sidewalks, not docked to anything as we know, and these pose barriers to people in wheelchairs, walkers, and scooters. They also impede people who are blind, who rely on predictable routes and cane detection. Bikes left in the public right of way can interrupt these routes and create unnecessary obstacles. People with disabilities and people who are blind can't move the bikes, they can't see them, they could trip and fall, and worse than that, have a serious injury. The biggest thing I wanna emphasize is that in today's rapidly changing world with technology, we see new technology being created and implemented so quickly that we haven't had a chance to really understand how it works and what barriers it can impose. We've seen this with Uber and Airbnb. They were put in place almost instantaneously before figuring out anything about accessibility. People with disabilities weren't included in either of these platforms and still struggle today to get access to both. Um, other things we have to be concerned about are the accessibility of the scooters and people riding on the sidewalks. As we know, sidewalks are meant for pedestrians and we're really concerned about the speed of the scooters. So I would urge you to proceed slowly and thoughtfully and to think about people with disabilities in every aspect of this program, whether it be on the sidewalks, on the scooters, or just um, basically people who are trying to get to work, trying to get home to family, trying to um, go shopping, and really just need access to the sidewalks. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll go to counselors for questions now, starting with the sponsor, Madam Alley. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Commissioner's Chief Director. I appreciate all your perspective and your great work. Um, I'll hop right into it with you, Chief Osgood. Uh, so you mentioned right now you're sort of helping to coordinate a regional framework. Um, so where are we in that process? So uh, I will, Christopher Sorry. Fandaka, uh, Stephanie Saskin, our Mayor's Office of New York Mechanics team have been really uh, sort of taking the lead on that, having conversations with uh, our adjacent municipalities and if they'd like, they can sort of talk a little bit about where we are in that process. Um, sure, so Council, the 
way that we have the Blue Bikes framework is that it's a regional system with Cambridge and Somerville and Brookline. Um, so we've been in conversations with those municipalities as well as some of our other neighbors to see, you know, what's the best approach for us to take collectively to have the conversation at the state level so that these, that these um, um, uh, scooters, when they're out on the street, uh, meet the overall guidelines that the municipalities have agreed to so that we can roll them out in a safe and equitable manner. Um, so those conversations are taking place now, um, and we anticipate that they'll continue as we sort of um, sort of imagine how that would work collectively as we march toward that spring of 2019. Okay. So what's the, I appreciate that, what is sort of the timeline in terms of, well, I guess it's, it's a two, sort of a, a multifaceted approach right now. Mm -hmm. uh, Chief mentioned about some um, uh, lack of clarity from the state legislature or from the mass general laws as it relates to uh, uh, motorized scooters. Now, many people would argue I would be one of them that that was written decades ago talking about a Vespa, talking about a gasoline motorized vehicle. This is a very, very different uh, vehicle, so to speak. Uh, I know several uh, state senators, including Senator Joe Boncori, who represents part of Boston, have said we should remove that. They're willing to do legislation that will that will carve out electric scooters from what was or adapt the legislation as such. So that's happening on one side, and then the other side, you, Commissioner, working with your colleagues in Brookline, Somerville, Cambridge, uh, and coming up with sort of some guidelines and oversight. What's the timeline for that? Will there be an opportunity for folks to weigh in? I, I guess how I, I'm delighted to hear that you all share the goal that I have to have a spring rollout for at least a pilot program. That I think is eminently doable. Um, but where are we in sort of the timeline for that or the process for that? At this point, they're, they're working in tandem. So as the conversations are taking place at the state level to um, sort of uh, revise the guidelines around what is an electric scooter and, and how do they fit into the mobility landscape that's regulated at the mm -hmm. state level. The, the conversations are taking place um, among the municipalities, uh, similar to the way we framed the Blue Bikes Network okay. here, um, that, that they would be rolled out on a regional level and that the mobility mm -hmm. options would be available um, sort of cross-jurisdictionally. So, so is it safe to say that by December, we'll have some sort of framework, and then from there we'll begin fine-tuning it in January, February? I would say that those conversations are taking place now, so we'd be happy to continue to keep you updated as they progress. Um, you know, certainly it's a, a project that if we hope to get off the ground in, in the spring that would need to accelerate the, the conversations now. Okay, and is the thought that we would partner with a single vendor as we did with Blue Bikes or this would be open to all, um, you know, would-be companies, legitimate companies, like those that we'll hear from later? Or is that not so been determined I, yet? I, I think the, yeah, please absolutely go for it. So with Blue Bikes, as a reminder, that's a publicly owned transportation system. So those bikes and stations are owned by the city of Boston, the city yeah. of Cambridge, et cetera. Yeah. And what we did was contract for a single operator to manage them yep. on a day-to-day -day basis for us. So that's, it's different than what we're going for here. In conversations with um, our partner municipalities internally and with people at the state level, um, we'd like it to be more open so that more companies could potentially provide. We just have to think about how many and what the right framework is for their participation. Okay, but there would be, that's, I actually think that's a good approach, so I appreciate that, Stephanie. So it wouldn't be limited to, you know, it wouldn't be an RFP or an RFQ for one potential you know, vendor, this would be maybe a set of regulatory oversight and guidelines, and we, I mean, I'm sure a number would have to be put in place. I know that's what I believe Seattle and some other cities did. Right, I think there's a lot of questions about how you actually, how you create a cap. Is it a dynamic cap? If it's a dynamic cap, what's it based on? I think yeah. those are all the sort of things, to the commissioner's point, that we would be working through essentially over the course of sort of this fall into the winter with the okay. idea that then we'd have that sort of at the city level, clarity around sort of the authority and the actual, how we, how we imagine designing the system. Yeah. And then moving into, again, this is sort of the ideal uh, uh, sort of timeline right now, sort of late winter into spring of how you actually then 
make selections, issue permits, all those sort of pieces. But that the, all the specifics that you're talking about are exactly the ones that we're trying to think through right now. Okay. So, okay. Councilor, a good framework for that is our Drive Boston program, and you reference sort of that shared mobility um, framework. And so uh, with that program, we uh, initially started with multiple providers, and that was through you know, an, an, a public offering um, with companies coming in and asking for spots on the street and in our municipal parking lots to share vehicles. Um, that was a, a good framework and, and a good foundation for us getting into the shared mobility arena. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that that seems to make a lot of sense. And, and when we talk about a pilot, it's not as though because these are, you know, the the attraction of these things is they are dockless. So it's not as though we could say we're piloting this in the North End or we're piloting this in West Roxbury because presumably whoever uses them will move and leave them elsewhere. So I guess the last question, and you may have answered this already uh, as it relates to this. It, would it be a certain number that we'd be looking at? For example, there'll be X number of scooters sort of regionally, or is that, and is that a number that we can be somewhat dynamic about? So the way we want to start is figuring out what is the transportation issue we want to solve? What is the mobility service that we want to be able to provide, and at what scale do we want to be able to pilot it? Yeah. Um, to your point around it being mobile, yes, there is some, obviously these things uh, would migrate uh, yeah. uh, throughout the city, um, but there's a question of where they get rebalanced to every morning. Um, so we really can, to Councilor Janey's point, think about how do we make sure that they are not sort of all ending up in one particular cluster, but are actually accessible uh, throughout the entire city. I think that's something which we would certainly be interested in looking at. To your good question about sort yep. of what, what scale would we actually start with, again, I think we want to look at some, look at how other municipalities had started and think about what's the right size for our city to be able to learn, what's the right size for our city uh, to be able to, again, solve some of the, the mobility challenges, yep. which is why you sponsored this in the first place. Yeah, and this, this is music to my ears, because mm -hmm. one of the reasons why we called this hearing initially is because there seemed to be, you know, two reactions to electric scooters specifically. One is cities that would have this sort of phobic reaction, no, absolutely not, they're banned from our streets, to others not having any regulatory oversight or framework and having them sort of flood the streets without a, a, a smart approach yes. to it. Um, so it sounds to me as though you feel pretty confident that by the spring we'll at least, by the spring is, is our shared deadline to work with the neighboring cities and towns, at least three of them. Mm -hmm. Um, to come up with a plan in place, and is, is there any potential issue that could thwart that, that we'll be sitting here and... I would flag again the Massachusetts General Law, so that, and I, uh, I the reason that language is in the, yeah. the Massachusetts General Law is in many ways to ensure the safety of those who are riding, uh, sort of, they may be yeah. Vespa's today, but scooters today. That is exactly the sort of thing we would like uh, folks to consider as they think about amending that law, if that yeah. is the route that it that goes. How do we make sure that anybody who's using this vehicle is actually... Uh, has uh, sort of good safety, the, the, the vehicle is designed with their safety in mind. Understood. And I would just say I was heartened by in the Glo recent Globe article about this uh, DOT uh, spokesman had said we're not in the position of policing or of, of you know, uh, this thing. So I think there's an opportunity there. I'd also say, Madam Chair, perhaps part of this, if my colleagues are so inclined, we could uh, urge action at the state level to, uh, to address that issue. And then my last question, uh, Commissioner McCosh, I specifically wanted you to be here for this hearing, um, and I appreciate your testimony, and I think it is crucial that we make sure that you uh, have a seat at the table at every step of this process. Can you talk a little bit about new challenges that you have seen? We're not really talking about the dockless bikes in so far, but, but that has been an issue. I see it, you know, when I walk around the neighborhood. Can you talk a little bit about some of the newer issues? Uh, you you touched upon it briefly in your opening remarks, but ways we ought to be perhaps hyper-focused on making sure that we have clean, accessible, passable sidewalks for all? Yes, uh, certainly. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, like I said, we worked a long time to develop the complete, complete streets guidelines. I have staff in my office who work with public works and transportation on a daily basis to make sure the sidewalks are clear path of, of travel. So with the dockless bikes, I know that they can be left anywhere. And my real big concern is that they're left, um, you know, in the path of travel where pieces of them could be sticking out, um, particularly for people who are blind. Uh, the way um, the routes are now throughout the city, they're predictable. So people who are blind know their paths. They, um, the barriers are cane detectable because they're within certain architectural guidelines. So when they're using a cane, they can, um, you know, know where a tree pit is, they'll know where a fence is, they know when the sidewalks are coming up for the, um, uh, the tactile warning strips. But if we have bikes everywhere, they could just be, you know, a handlebar could be sticking out, a wheel could be sticking out. And like I said earlier, people with disabilities aren't in a position to move them or even to walk around them. Because to get around them, you may have to go to the street, you may have to try to squeeze by. 
Um, right now, the complete streets calls for a minimum of four foot clear path of travel. So we maintain that with everything, with uh, snow shoveling, with construction, with tree pits, with um, everything that we do currently. And just to go back to, you talk about new technology, things like um, Uber, that, you know, we all know that came in, you know, like a fury a few years ago. And we had worked really hard with the cab industry, the taxi industry, because the city regulates that. So we could work with them and say, okay, a certain percentage of the taxi fleet has to be accessible. But with private companies who are doing dockless bikes, we really don't have that uh, oversight. So I really wanna make sure we get in at the beginning. And we know it's coming, we know it's, it's popular, but we don't want it, we wanna get ahead of it. And we don't, like with Uber, we didn't. Yeah. All of a sudden, Uber was out there, tens of thousands of vehicles, and there was no access for people with disabilities. Whereas we had worked for years with the taxis to make sure that they had accessible cabs. So right now, we're trying to catch up with Uber. We're trying to catch up with Airbnb. Because Airbnb is basically, for a lot of people, re replacing hotels. We know hotels have accessible rooms. Airbnb doesn't even talk about access. So we, like you said, we want to make sure we talk about it. We want to figure it out. We want to see if we can put some parameters in place as, as far as where people can dock the bikes, where people can't dock the bikes. And then talk about regulation. Who's going to enforce it? Is it going to be Public Works? Is it going to be BTD? Is it going to be a new um, position in the city? And how do we uh, ensure that enforcement happens? Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor O'Malley. Councillor Flynn. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Council. And um, thank you to the panelists. Um, I was thoroughly impressed with Commissioner McCosh and your, your comments about how this will impact those in the um, disability community. You know, we want to be a city that welcomes technology that's on the cutting edge of technology. But more importantly than that, we want to be the city that always makes sure that our, those in the disability community is treated with respect and dignity. And that's far more important than any other issue. And so I think you spelled it out very clearly, Commissioner, and I know we're proud of the hard work that you've done for this city for so many, for so many years. Um, Chief, I would, I, I, th I thought I, I thought I heard you say um, that th these scooters would be allowed on the sidewalks. Um, can you clarify that or? Uh, as we think about issues of, of parking or uh, sort of where a scooter gets, uh, gets placed at the end of a trip, that is exactly the sort of thing which we want to work through in the, in the essentially our overall framework and potentially they get stored in, in the furnishing zone or, or are there sections of uh, a sidewalk that they could be placed. That's the sort of thing which we want to work through over the course of this fall and the winter. Uh, again, with exactly the comments from uh, Commissioner McCosh in mind about what the right place is to, uh, to leave a scooter at the end of its trip. Yeah, I mean, I, I would never be in support of, of someone using a scooter on a sidewalk, of course. Right. I, I, um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the streets, the sidewalks in my community in South Boston and Chinatown are almost at times not passable for people to walk on them. Never mind, never mind adding, adding a scooter. I, I apologize. I, I, I just was. Uh, I did not draw a clear distinction between actually where you would operate the scooter and where you would sort of leave the scooter at the end of your trip. And okay. one of the things we're sort of looking through is where would you actually leave the scooter at the end of your trip? Is that fair? Uh, y yes, Councilor. That, that's exactly it. When we cite blue bike stations, we go through um, an extensive review process that includes the Transportation Department, the Public Improvement Commission, as well as um, Commissioner Rakash's office. So there's a sign-off um, as well as with any uh, um, abutting property owners as well. So, for example, the blue bike station that we just put on Farragut Road, um, that's on the sidewalk. That was approved um, not only by the Transportation Department, but, but by the Public Improvement Commission, as well as Commissioner Rakash, to ensure that there's um, safe, adequate um, access for all individuals that would need to use that that sidewalk for safe passage. Okay, I'm al I'm also thank thank you, Commissioner. I'm also <coughs> concerned about um, you know our elderly um, that have a difficult time at times um, navigating our sidewalk sidewalks as well, especially those living um, you know in whether it's in public housing, whether it's living in um, elderly housing. Um, just as an example, if you're going up L Street by 
um, you know, the powers, or if you're on the other side of the street, on L Street going towards Broadway from, from Fourth, it's, those streets are very narrow. There's poles, electric poles um, in the area, and, um, you know, it's barely passable for, for people to get, to get by. So I'm, I'm very concerned about some of those issues, and I'm also concerned about, you know, the rollout. I, I want to make sure that we're 100 percent sure that there's going to be no issues at all for those in the disability community uh, before we roll out a pilot, pilot plan. Um, I've called for a hearing, um, I believe, next month on um, access for the disabled. And um, those are critical issues. I want to make sure that we resolve every issue um, before we even roll this out. Public safety is critical. Uh, pedestrian, uh, pedestrian safety is critical. And uh, making sure that our streets are safe for the elderly, um, for those in the disability community. Um, we see a lot of uh, parents with uh, baby carriages as well. How, how will that impact um, your decision making? We agree. We absolutely agree that uh, we, we cannot roll out a program which uh, makes it harder for people to simply get around the city of Boston. That's the opposite of the intent of what we're trying to, uh, to achieve here. I think your, your questions are actually uh, very important for us to consider in the ordinance process and very good questions as well for uh, those who will be uh, uh, the private companies who will potentially be providing scooters in the city of Boston. Um, part of this is about the framework and the rules and exactly as the commissioner said, the enforcement that we put in place around those. Um, and part of it as well is for uh, potential companies who would have a license to operate in the city of Boston, how they sort of educate and ensure that any scooters uh, that are operating in the city of Boston actually meet the high standards that you're articulating. Okay, I just, I want to be clear to these private companies that, you know, pedestrian safety, public safety and access for the disabled um, has to be factored in here. And, Agreed. you know, all, all communities, the pedestrian, pu public safety, and the disability community, they, their issues are, are, should be at the forefront. And um, they must be taken into consideration. And I don't want to roll something out when, when everyone's not on board. Again, I'm not against this, but my top priority is, is, the, is pedestrian safety. My top priority is access for the disabled and for the elderly. And I don't want to roll anything out before we're ready. It's well heard. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Councillor Zakum. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I uh, want to thank our panel here. Um, I will uh, just reiterate my earlier comments that I think this is a great uh, thing that we should be bringing to the city of Boston. We should be doing it thoughtfully um, and cooperatively. But um, as I think Councillor Flynn just said, um, you know, my concern is my paramount concern here is not running into something and having issues with accessibility uh, on our sidewalks. So uh, I think that's doable. It sounds like other cities are doing it and it sounds like we've been talking and looking at how that is and I'm sure we'll hear from uh, some of these folks in this industry on how they've cooperated but uh, this body and certainly the city of Boston can't abdicate our responsibility on that front and if it, we need to get changes in the state law, which it sounds like uh, we may need to do. I think we need to be thinking about working for that in partnership uh, with the mayor, with your administration uh, to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Zakim. Councillor Janey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you, panel. I especially appreciate uh, your comments and your presentation, Commissioner McCosh, um, how this uh, could potentially impact the disability community certainly share the concerns of Councillor Flynn, as I said earlier, around uh, safety. And I'm wondering, uh, Chief, if you could just um, kind of give this overview of who uh, gets to use our sidewalks now. So right now, it's not just pedestrians, right? Our cyclists are able to ride bikes on si sidewalks? So or Commissioner not? Stephanie may be able to sort of speak more to the, the legal. Yeah. Uh, was, <laughs> Cy cyclists are, are allowed um, to ride on the sidewalks, although we do encourage them to utilize the bike lanes in the city to provide a low-stress low network and to reduce conflict points with, with pedestrians. Right. And scooters, the current scooters that are on our streets, are they allowed to ride on the sidewalk? I, we can get back you to mean yeah. scooters yeah. like this? Motorized, 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 motorized no. or, or just the others? I assume the others that kids use can ride on the sidewalks. So again, there's uh, 
clarification in state law that's needed. Right now, what we use is motorized scooters, which are more of the Vespa types, but also cover this type. And by state law, they are not allowed on the sidewalks. And what motorized vehicles are? Just None. wheelchairs? What about well, scooters that elderly uh, people use to get around? Those would be, those would not be considered right. motorized scooters those in would that be definition. They kind have of a separate a, definition. Okay. Yes. Um, Mobility aid devices are, are allowed on sidewalks. Okay, wonderful. And are there speed limits in place for different vehicles, or are all vehicles supposed to adhere to the posted signage, or is it different if you're a, a bike or motorized scooter or some other kind of device? Well, we don't have limit, speed limits, per se, for, for cyclists, for, for bicycles. Um, but the, it's, a, it's a, a rather confusing process for speed limits as it relates to the size of the engine mm -hmm. on the, the, um, the scooter. Um, and so that is regulated by the Registry of Motor Vehicles at the state level. Um, these um, scooters here, as, as far as I understand, <laughs> Um, uh, go about 20 miles per hour, but I believe that any sort of um, miles per hour limit would, would be part of any ordinance or, or um, regulation on the, the city municipal level. And is that something you're fast? Is that something uh, you guys are thinking about? That, that, is, that is certainly something that we're very cognizant of, particularly with regard to you know, Vision Zero and our public safety programs that um, you know, as, as lower speed limits is, is certainly something that this council, this body has supported. Um, the speed limit for motor vehicles in the city of Boston is 25 miles per hour. So um, any uh, speed limits enacted as it relates to, to scooters would be uh, far, far, far lower. Right. And to be very clear, just to build on uh, what Councilor Flynn was saying earlier, we're not talking about motorized scooters on sidewalks. That's correct. correct. We're not. At all. Correct. In the streets. Um, and in terms of enforcement, that uh, I think that came up earlier in the panel discussion or one of the comments of my colleagues. Is there clarity yet on who would be enforcing? So that is... Uh, speed or yeah. we're scooters are being left yeah. or parked or docked so or not docked because they're docked. Or before we sort of establish or actually issue permits, there's mm -hmm. a set of sort of enabling ordinance uh, largely for the Boston Transportation Department uh, about how we would actually manage a electric scooter pilot and that would include sections about enforcement which we're still working through. Who has the responsibility? How does the, how do the penalties work? Can we impound all those sort of things, which would be tied with enforcement or potentially tied with enforcement? And that's exactly what we're working through right now. And which towns um, are you working with? Except for you want to cities and towns. Right now, um, Cambridge, Somerville, and Brookline. Um, but generally, with the uh, with MAPC and whatever communities in that region who are interested in working on scooters with us. And by spring, you hope to have what in place, Chief? So with the intent of having uh, sort of the framework in place by this winter and be able to issue uh, permits for a pilot program or to move forward with the pilot program in the spring. Okay, thank you. That's it for this panel, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Janey. Councilor Sabi George. Oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't see. Uh, we have one more, so please Thank you, Councilor. Add one thing for reference. Um, personal mobility devices are classed in class one, two, or three. In class three is the highest um, classification as far as a powered mobility mm -hmm. device, and those speed limits are limited to under seven miles per hour, I believe. Okay. Just for reference. But, so I have a follow up question, if I may, Madam Chair. <laughs> and so um, if they're limited to seven miles per hour, can the device go faster than that? How fast can devices go? I believe a personal mobility device um, is under the F FDA, so that's all regulated and they're not built to go faster than that. I don't know about scooters and okay. segways and other things. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Salvi George. Thank you, Chair. Um, gave me a minute to finish my notes there anyway. Can we talk a little bit about the restrictions that state law may present us with? So it's mentioned a little bit, and I'm curious about those limitations and what we're able to have a conversation about going forward without changes to state law and where those limitations might be. 
Um, so the state law right now um, has two definitions. They have a motorized bicycle and a motorized scooter. Um, the definition for motorized scooter very clearly includes these um, e-scooters that are here today. Um, it does require certain things, um, as the chief mentioned earlier, about turning signals, brake lights, um, operating hours, helmets, the requirement to have a driver's license. Um, those are all enshrined in state law. Um, they apply to things that you stand on, things that you sit on, um, that have a certain engine size. It doesn't matter if it's electric or gas powered, they're all treated the same. And then there's motorized bicycle, which is a category just above that, that has additional issues um, and uh, might come into play if we want to talk more about e-bikes, for example. Um, and then there's yeah, sort of motorcycles and things like that beyond. And those are all above 50 cc regulated by the registrar. Things below 50 cc, which include these types of scooters, um, are not regulated by the registrar. So they are, um, uh, they don't necessarily have a license plate or um, a trackable uh, personal number on each vehicle, things like that. Um, so the challenges that we face today, just to start with those, um, a person can't just look at a vehicle and tell if it's 50 cc or more or less. Um, and so sometimes we have issues with Vespa type um, scooters that uh, are parked, um, but uh, understanding where they are and aren't allowed is also an issue that I would like to clarify in state law. I'm going off script here, sorry, but I, I do really feel like multiple issues should be addressed if we're going to, st to the state legislature, not just to allow these scooters, but to otherwise um, clarify a lot of questions that our constituents have about where they are and aren't allowed to park, um, how fast they can go, when they can drive, um, all of those things too. I do think that the education piece is really important. You know, first understanding from from your office and from our role what is allowed, where we might look to make any changes um, to that or ask for exemptions to that and better understand it. So I appreciate that and I look forward to um, that roadmap ahead and sort of what the, the plan will be going forward into the spring. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilor Sabi George. Councilor Edwards. Hi, thank you all for being here today. Um, just wanted to pick up on uh, some of the themes I've heard with Commissioner Rakosh. Um, I'm actually a, I'm a board member of the Boston Center for Independent Living, and I think um, I'm so encouraged by my colleagues. Uh, you know, there are questions about accessibility and of course is your role and your leadership, your proven leadership um, already in assuring that um, Boston is, is a more accessible city. Um, so I'm curious about, maybe you can educate me about some of the ways in which we can lead here uh, in ways that we didn't lead with Uber and with um, Airbnb. Um, and I'm particularly curious if there's a, a possibility of an advisory group that's led by folks in the community, yourself, that really are meeting with those private companies and, and, and laying it out for them well in advance um, from a disability perspective. Because if it's accessible for folks with disabilities, it's accessible for all. So your advocacy helps us all. So your leadership then is vital. And so what, what are your thoughts about an advisory group um, that's centered from a perspective um, from folks in the disability community, uh, please, or if that's already happening, educate me. Thank you, Counselor. Uh, that would be my biggest recommendation is some sort of advisory group to have someone with uh, accessibility knowledge and uh, uh, expertise on the group. We did that with the Tax Advisory Committee that the mayor created. And that's why we were able to make really good progress on access with the taxis. And with Uber, as we all know, I'm sure people in this room, committees were built after, the, after it was already up and running. State legislation happened after it was up and running. But with the taxis, we were able to do it mostly because it was a public, I mean, a, a, yeah, a public, we, we had some control over it. Mm -hmm. With Uber, we didn't have control. With the dockless scooters, we may not have control. So I would certainly suggest uh, an advisory group and then just talking about some sort of regulations, whether it will be a requirement by ordinance to only leave them in certain places, if we can, I, and I don't know what the solutions would be, but certainly to have some sort of regulations that would work for this type of business that would ensure accessibility. Excellent, and I think um, one of the other themes that my counselor, um, Janie, had brought up my, uh, was a matter of equity. 
and that's generally for amongst communities, but I think also there's a real, um, a lot of folks don't talk about it, but there's a real divide within even the disability community of income levels and, and whether you have income or not can really determine your entire access to life-saving, uh, you know, um, services, let alone. And so, as I'm glad you like the theme or the thought of the advisory group, I hope they also address the equity issues within the disability community, diversity issues as well, um, and making sure that uh, when we talk, we're talking amongst, uh, for all. Um, and the other thing, I, I, I'm not sure how this works right now, this is, could be a general um, question, language accessibility and understanding instructions. Uh, I, I don't know right now when I look at the, I haven't looked too closely at some of the blue, the docking stations, are they in more than one language? Our blue bike stations are fully English, Spanish, French. Excellent, excellent. So I would assume the same standard would be applied or you would require that in this pilot program as well? Okay, um, and then I think um, one, of the, one of the areas where I feel like this, there could be a boom in use and I'd love to hear your thoughts about this, is in um, school transportation. Uh, I'm not sure if you, do you need a license right now? Do you need to be 18 years old to use the electronic scooters? You need to have a driver's license. You need to have a driver's license. And I'm sorry, I didn't, I got mine in Michigan. And what's the age here to get your driver's license? 16. 16. So, um, so yeah, the, I got transportation issues. Folks are trying to get to school. I, would this not be something that would be considered by some parents or some family members uh, for their kids to get to school on? And is that something we wanna, I, I, I don't know. I, I, it seems like it would be a wonderful way, uh, or a horrible way. You tell me, <laughs> uh, uh, based on your research, have, has, have kids used this? I think it's a, a moderately independent way to allow them to go short of driving a car to school. I don't, they couldn't do it from East Boston, right? They gotta go to the tunnel. Well, we would wanna make sure they know that they can't do it from East Boston, but um, <laughs> I'm gonna be frightened about that. Won't borrow any trouble right now. But um, talk to me about like kids using these things and possibly using them to go to school. I, <coughs> I think that, that would certainly be something that we would need to have some conversations with the, the school department on, um, as well as with, with parents. Um, to see, you know, how does a, a new mobility option fit into the the options that, that we provide or that we endorse for um, students to sort of fill the gaps in our transit network? Uh, certainly, safety is our number one priority. Um, it's safe operation, uh, safe uh, infrastructure, and equitable access. Um, the public transit is probably where we would look to really, uh, you know, fortify and supplement our transit offerings through, through the school department. But, you know, certainly there are, are, are kids today that, that are riding bicycles to, to school. Mm. Um, you know, we see it all the time. We encourage, you know, uh, active mobility. We have a program uh, through, run through Stephanie's office that will actually go out into schools. We bring the bikes, we bring the helmets, we teach children who have never been on a bicycle how to ride a bicycle. Um, and then we take them at the conclusion of the program out and a ride through their neighborhoods. So, you know, clearly, you know, we support active transportation. We want to just ensure that anything that we endorse is, is uh, implemented in a safe way. Yeah, and I just, because I, and how would you enforce um, the 16 year old with a license on that versus the 14 or 13 year old with no license? Yeah, uh, yeah th th those are, are all issues that we really need to um, sort of plan into any, any pilot program that, that we offer. Uh, whether it's through partnering with the school department with our public safety agencies. Um, you know, in, enforcement takes sort of a, a multi-pronged approach, right. enforcement of the provider and adhering to, you know, sort of the guidelines that, that we collectively agree to um, in terms of the offerings to the customer and then sort of the end user making sure that they're operated in a, in a safe way on our streets. Right, I, I'm cautiously optimistic about this. I think with, with your leadership, Commissioner Mikosh, and assuring we have an advisory group, and your leadership, obviously, Commissioner Fiondaka, uh, we're gonna see um, Boston lead in a, in a very unique way, learning from other cities. Um, but again, it's, you know, I think I, I would have been on these things if I was 13, 14, I would have loved it. I mean, it looks like a lot of fun. I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna lie, but I wanna make sure that we're doing this um, in the best way possible. So thank you so much for coming out and I'm really excited about your leadership and thank you for that, for the pilot program. And of course, my compliments to the, the drafter of the ordinance, uh, um, my colleague, Matt O'Malley. So I'm sorry. Thank you, Councillor Edwards.
Okay, I have just a few questions that I've been saving. Um, so starting with the, the pilot and the type of contract that you're looking at, how likely, I, I'm obviously there's still negotiations with the municipality, neighbor, with our neighbors, but um, how likely are you to have some, not just a dynamic cap based on usage that maybe goes up over the term of the pilot, but also requirements for equity built in yes. to the expansion of the individual caps? That's, I think that's very core to what we're looking at, and as well as you know, looking at uh, the potentially the impact that something like this has on our other shared micro mobility programs, blue bikes, uh, sort of most notably. We want to make sure that uh, what we're doing actually strengthens our overall transportation network. Uh, how do you do that? That is, we were, we've been having that conversation about how to sort of build a dynamic cap that really sort of doesn't look at necessarily a single metric, but really reflects the aspirations and the things that we're talking about, and and. Uh, really reinforces the concerns that we have about how to have a program like this work well. And so there's some work ahead of us to figure that out. So there'll be some analysis, and sorry to jump in, um, there'll be some analysis of what the appropriate starting number is to at least have scale, to give it a chance to work, but then a lot of it will be thinking about how to then adjust over what period of time. Are you leaning towards, is it a monthly increase? Is it is it a three month in increase? Will the pilot just be one batch and that's it? Um, Refer to the experts to my, to my right on that. Um, I wonder if you guys have thoughts already. I, and with regard to sort of um, a ramped up sort of rollout throughout the pilot, probably a, an approach that would take sort of an, al an analysis of the utilization. Um, we would be looking certainly to have some data that's made available to us to help inform, you know, our policy decisions. Uh, with regard to equity, uh, I would envision, you know, a partnership with some of these providers that would encourage sort of rebalancing of their offerings into uh, dispersed throughout our neighborhoods. Uh, we know that, you know, as we've seen with Blue Bikes, that they're very popular, that initially they were very popular downtown, and as we expanded the network, we expanded the reach of the offerings of the program. So with regard to um, sort of a, a phased approach to a pilot, would be looking to our providers to help uh, provide the information to us in terms of the utilization so that we can make informed decisions that take into consideration our equity. So one of the baseline expectations will be that each of the companies will provide, will share their data at least daily, if not in real time. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. We'll have a lot of data requirements. And then are you thinking now of, is it going to be a one-year pilot? Is it just until the fall when a more formal launch might happen? Just to kind of understand the expectations. Well, I think mm -hmm. that's still in conversation with the region. Um, any program, if it's here for two months but in Cambridge for three months, is obviously going to be here for three months. So we need to be thoughtful about working with our partners on that. Um, but I think that we would expect something that would at least last through the year through the end of the calendar year or through the year from spring to spring? We still have to talk about winter, yes. I don't, Got I don't know it. the okay. answer to what yeah. winter will look like. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. any, and in terms of feedback on what you all would be thinking after the negotiations with other municipalities, is there likely to be an opportunity to report back to the council or even have a meeting um, for us to, and the sponsor to, to kind of weigh in? Yeah, we, it, we, to create this sort of this pilot program, there is actually an ordinance which uh, we would be bringing to you. So there's, so there's a, there'll be another opportunity for uh, the council to be able to weigh mm -hmm. in. Okay. And do you expect that, um, and there are some things that it wouldn't make sense to have different cities doing differently, but some things that might be unique. And so I imagine our ordinance would look slightly different from Cambridge, Somerville, Brookline. Um, will you need to wait? until there is agreement on major things, like do you want to have a uniform speed limit? Do you want to have uniform rules about parking and curbside management? Or how much of it can Boston kind of do on its own? So the ordinance would uh, be a bit broader. I think we're trying to anticipate any other types of mobility that are coming. So it won't be specific to scooters. So that can move a lot faster. Um, but that sets up our baseline for working with our partners. Um, I think a lot of the pieces will need to be similar. We don't want to have different rules and different expectations that users won't be able to comply by. Um, I think there is a lot of agreement so far uh, with the other municipalities. We've been talking about scooters, at least at the staff level, for, I don't know, the, 
this entire calendar year probably. Um, we participated in the NACTO discussions around shared micromobility. We contributed to those guidelines. Um, you know, we're pretty invested in figuring out a way that works regionally and understanding that we do have a regional transportation network. Um, and so these choices are things that we need to agree on together um, as best as we can. So likely an ordinance sort of broadly just granting authority for the city to do it and probably handing over you know, the ability to promulgate regu specific regulations with the ordinance before the spring and then the pilot to launch. Um, will it be an RFP, do you think? Probably not. Okay, so there will be, so how does that work in terms of companies that are, it'll just be open and anybody is allowed to put a certain number of scooters in? That will still be uh, something to discuss. I think what we would, like to do is think about it as a permit, um, but we do need to think about how does a regional permitting work so that if each municipality goes with a different vendor, like that doesn't work. So um, we would like to think about that a little bit more. I, we're in a unique case in that we are so regional and that other municipalities have not done that level of municipal coordination on this issue yet. Um, so some of it is trying out ideas <laughs> before mm -hmm. we commit to them. I would highly encourage, and I'm all for streamlining things, but I would highly encourage thinking about an RFP just to, so that there's, there's just, I mean, just like Commissioner McCosh was saying earlier about taxis and our ability to, to mm -hmm. have that conversation, an RFP would also make sure that companies are, sub are subject to the city's new ordinance on diversity and inclusion and equity in contracting so that there would be the requirement to submit a diversity inclusion plan for the city to understand what their numbers are in terms of staffing and who they're hiring. I mean, what a shame if we are creating this whole new industry and because they're technically not exactly partnered with the city like Motivate is, that we then can't have any of that new wealth be generated and kept in our neighborhoods as well and, and helping to solve income inequality. Um, so that's something I would really push for. Um, Okay, um, in, Okay. so curbside management, are, we, we talked a little bit about parking and leaving the scooters or bikes, uh, or sorry, just to back one step, are, there, are we talking about dockless bikes at all then, or is it really just hub, I mean, uh, blue bikes and then electric scooters? So within the blue bike system, we have a lot of opportunity for new technologies that we have been working with Motivate on, and <coughs> they have piloted in some other communities, um, you know, with some success, um, some really good success, especially around their e-bike, um, but also some challenges that we wanna work through. Um, I don't think that we would be interested in having a bike that is just solely, can be parked wherever. Okay. I think we definitely want it to be locked to something to maintain our public right of way and the accessibility of that. Okay. And that's a product that we're working on. Um, I think for the ordinance, it's e-scooters and beyond. Yep. Um, and then for the pilot, it is around e-scooters specifically. Okay, so parking for e-scooters and curbside management, and if, are we thinking about just converting parking spaces to designated spots that, that these scooters could be left? I mean, you think about maybe five drivers are cycling through in one day versus seven to nine trips on the scooter times however many scooters fit in that spot, like 100 people <coughs> otherwise. I think these are all the sort of things which are really in front of us for this winter and then the permitting process sort of in the spring or the RFP process in the spring. Um, so I, I don't know if we have a specific answer at this point to that particular question, but it's exactly what we want to be exploring. Okay. I think we, we would take a similar approach to how we've um, blue cited bikes. blue bike stations. Yeah. So that they would be strategically located um, so as not to impede uh, sidewalk access or pedestrian access and, and also taking into consideration utilization of parking spaces for, for the, those docking stations or for the uh, collective uh, micromobility devices. It feels like a lot of parallel conversations happening mm -hmm. at the same time mm -hmm. before spring. So let us know how we can support any of the outreach to make sure people you know, know mm -hmm. the ways that they can, can give feedback. But it seems like all these strands have to come together for the program to really take off well. Um, okay, moving to infrastructure in general. I mean, one of my biggest frustrations is that a lot of the hub, the blue bike stations are located right where it's a really dangerous bike ride because there's no safe cycling infrastructure, even as you undock the bike and, and, and go. So 
how are the you know the investment by the mayor in this last year's budget to expand like protected cycle tracks? How will that line up with how you're going to be seeing the data from the usage of scooters? So as you know, sort of across the board, and uh, the transportation department's working on expanding the uh, low stress commuter bike network. Um, certainly, as we think about citing sort of any locations where these come, uh, where these would be sort of would start their trip or end their trip, um, having them sort of on a, a network is would be something which we'd be certainly looking at. Um, I think there's also a reason whether it is for um, scooters or for anything else, it is a um, all the more reason for us to continue to invest in uh, safe, comfortable, active ways that people can get around, particularly uh, with sort of public transit systems like uh, like the Blue Bike Network. Um, so we're very focused on sort of continuing to build out the uh, sort of protected bike lanes, cycle track, the th things like that, which would um, work well for bike share programs or potentially, depending upon the direction that we go with um, e-scooters at a particular uh, speed. Okay, and finally, um, related but separate on the conversation around parking, resident parking reforms. So I mean, this will be a lot about yes. curbside management, how it all fits together. Any progress or next steps in terms of thinking about potential changes to that? Uh, in terms of sort of dedicating uh, sort of existing parking spaces for places for scooter storage? Or making the system more efficient by thinking about charges or mm. you know, much needed funding for right. infrastructure improvements. So I think there is an opportunity for any um, uh, sort of e-scooter provider uh, to think about how they do invest in the infrastructure on streets to make to sort of improve the overall public realm and to actually uh, create a better mobility network uh, for their users and others. And so I think we would have a that'd be a specific part of what we want to look at in the permitting process mm -hmm. to see is there uh, um, are there any charges associated with their use of the street that would actually uh, go back to building investing in infrastructure uh, through the transportation department or beyond. But on the resident parking side, any changes since the last hearing or discussion? Not that I'm aware of, unless okay. there was, okay. Uh, no, but we can certainly have that okay, as a we'll follow-up conversation. Yep, so. conversation. All right, thank you. Any of my colleagues have follow-ups? Councilor O'Malley. Just a brief follow-up, because I do want to get to the next uh, couple panels. Um, thank you again. I, I think my comments sort of speak for them. Selves. I'm very excited about this opportunity. I think having a pilot in place by the fall is a uh, aggressive but an achievable goal. And obviously, I sit here ready to work with all of you to make sure that we can um, address any of the concerns. And I think many of my colleagues brought up concerns, which I certainly share. But I think we, as a city, have an opportunity to really lead as it relates to innovation, as it relates to transportation, once again. Um, I guess the only concern I would have would be that, and I, I, I'll preface this by saying I think it's a smart approach to look regionally, starting with those four um, uh, or three partnered cities that we use our, our bike share program with, and I believe MAPC says about 15 cities and towns in greater Boston have some sort of a thing, including the electric bikes. I don't know that they have electric scooters yet, but I know Malden, for example, has the e-assist bike. If we are unable to come to an agreement with the, our three partners, would that then shelve this program? Or I, I guess I'm looking for assurances from all of you that in the unlikely yet real potential event that we're unable to come up with some sort of agreement or an understanding or an MOU, would Boston then go, go it alone in terms of looking at a pilot program for the spring of 2019? I don't think that we're not going to come to agreement. Yeah. We work oh. well together, the four municipalities that are part of the blue bike system, and yeah. we work well with others. I don't think that there's going to be an issue where any one of us goes alone. I, I hope you're, I'm, I'm sure you're the case, but I get, because as I understand it, initially, uh, Hubway was only in Boston, so. That is true, but again, it's a different system in that it's a publicly owned system and it had to do with procurement and um, other issues that okay. are not relevant in a world where what we're doing is regulating a private business. Okay. I think it would be very hard to not work with our, uh, with these other municipalities as we launch something. I think it would be actually hard for us to go alone because I think it would end up, uh, they would inevitably have scooters that end up in their municipalities and we would need to think about I think it's best for us to start 
uh, ideally as a set of municipalities and build a system that works well for all of our constituents. I think we've seen that sort of repeatedly through our experience with the Blue Bike Network, and that's sure. why we want to. That's why we're very focused on having it work well for the region from the start. Okay, and and I don't mean to to dissuade you or perhaps cause a false panic as it relates yep. to. I'm all about building consensus and particularly looking at a regional approach to all transportation. I just think it's something we should be mindful of um, because it, in order for this to work, we need to make sure. And then I appreciate the the idea that this would come as a uh, ordinance to the city council, um, and then that would give us an opportunity to again, um, you know, help. Uh, help uh, raise public awareness, public education, and so forth. So thank you for that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councilor Janey or Councilor Sabi George, any other questions? Okay, my last question is just, um, what would be a reasonable point in time to get a check-in for the council that's late enough that there's more details with the municipalities, but early enough for our feedback to still be meaningful? I would say um, close to the, the end of the calendar year. Okay, great. Yeah, I think we wanna have an ordinance drafts pretty soon so mm -hmm. all right thank you very much thank you really appreciate your time um, feel free to stay or um, listen to our other panelists as we switch over to the next panel which um, I'm informed by Councilor Valley's team will include Scott <coughs> Mullen from Lyme Hannah Smith from Bird Miller Nuttall from Lyft and potentially someone from spin if they're present um, feel free to do the switch and come down to the council floor and while we do the change, we'll do uh, another chunk of public testimony. Uh, let's see. Currently, the only person signed up for this now is Olivia Richard. Olivia, if you would like to make your way to either of the podiums. Sorry, brought my own. <laughs> that joke will never get old. <laughs> I'm a resident of Brighton. Um, I'm also uh, a member of Mass Adapt, the uh, Boston chapter of National Adapt, a disability rights group. Um, no one is a fan of this technology in my community. It's another piece of technology that we are getting left behind on. Um, I can't use it. My friends can't use it. What's the point? You know, it's it's like Uber and Lyft, where we had to kind of bully them after into providing very minimal service. Um, I got to see these Bird and Lime scooters uh, in live action when I went to Denver, and um, rider behavior is is different than what you think you can ordinance and legislate. Um, I saw people riding it anywhere and everywhere, and I saw very little helmet usage, which, hey, if you want to become a member of my community, that's a way to do it. Dead serious. Um, I've also got a concern around how quiet they are um, it's if you're coming from behind and you've got someone who's blind or low vision, they don't know it's there. They come with a bell, but you have to remember to use it, um, which may or may not happen. Uh, we have this same issue with electronic cars, with, with um, electric cars, where there's actually a federal standard that they had to make them more noisy because blind and people with low vision weren't able to distinguish the car was coming at them. Um, and I can tell you the scooters are quiet, they're efficient, that's for sure. And they will make a good opportunity for those who can use it to get around. Um, the issues on, on blocking the street and whatnot have been raised numerous times. I'm not gonna beat a dead horse at this point, it's a horse zombie. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's, that I've raised all my points. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, if our second panel would please uh, come and take a seat on the floor.
Madam Chair, as the uh, panel assembles, I just wanted to acknowledge for the record that uh, Hannah Smith, who will be on this panel, previously worked for me as my Jamaica Plain liaison from 2014 through 2015. So thank you, Hannah, and she did a great job. Duly noted. Great, so welcome, and um, again, if each of you would like to introduce yourselves and um, identify your affiliation, your residence, and feel free to give an opening statement. Uh, let's start with Hannah. Good morning, counselors. Thank you for having me. My name is Hannah Smith. I'm a government relations manager for BIRD. As mentioned by Councillor O'Malley, I previously lived in Boston, and I'm currently based in New York City. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, don't worry about um, having to push any buttons. They'll adjust if you give it a second whenever Great. you're speaking. Sounds good, thanks. Uh, my name is Miller Nuttall. I'm on the bike and pedestrian policy team at Lyft. Uh, I live across the river in Central Square. Good morning, uh, afternoon now, actually. I wanna uh, thank Council Chair for, for calling this, uh, or having this meeting, and, and for host, Council O'Malley, for uh, taking leadership on this. Uh, Micromobility is a new thing, as, as we're all seeing. Uh, my name is Scott Mullen. I'm the Director of Expansion for Lyme in the Northeast. I live out by Alewife, and I came in by scooter today. Great, do I, either any of you have an opening statement, or and should we? You, I'm sorry, uh, is there anyone from SPIN that's here as well? We purposefully invited every East Coast uh, vendor, so I don't know if nobody's from SPIN is here, then thank you, Madam Chair. Mm. I'm happy if you do, yeah, thank you. Great. Um, so I have to say it is a thrill to be back in this chamber. Um, I'm no um, uh, stranger to uh, micromobility uh, in, in Boston, specifically with Hubway, which is now Blue Bikes. Um, I was uh, fortunate enough to serve from 2011 to 2013 as a general manager of this system. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of parallels with that time that I'm seeing right now, uh, meaning this is something new, people aren't quite sure what it is, the sky's gonna fall, um, all valid points, right? We have to think, what, wh how is this gonna fit into uh, uh, the new, uh, or, or help drive the new transportation paradigm here in Boston? Uh, what we do know is that a new transportation paradigm is needed, and we heard a lot of the uh, um, comments from councilors, specifically uh, Zakem and Councilor Flynn, um, talking about how, you know what, the sidewalk already doesn't work, and we're hearing that from our public comments as well. And we really wanna come in and be seen as uh, a, a catalyst for change. We know that dedicating 95% of the public right of way to the movement and storage of private vehicles is not working. We know that. Now scooters, they may seem new, they may seem weird, they may seem odd. They can be part of that mix, but it's really important that we think about this in terms of uh, what are the outcomes that we want? not what are we trying to legislate that we don't want, right? And this is why the, the uh, um, uh, position of our company and really the, the, the way we approach cities is collaborative. I've been uh, riding the scooter around City Hall since April <laughs> and been bringing it to each one of the counselors and their staff, uh, made it almost all the way through at this point. Um, and it's really important that we get out ahead of this and say what do we want the future to look like uh, and then try to get there together. Um, Two years, Hubway, uh, I, I heard as Councillor O'Malley said at the beginning, um, the biggest complaint was why aren't you in my neighborhood? Um, and, and that was something that, uh, it, was hard to, it was hard to answer. These stations are $50,000 each, heavy infrastructure, federal money, private uh, sponsorships and all that. Um, and, and I know that Mattapan got their first station about three weeks ago. That's seven years in, that's a long time to wait. Uh, but it's a good thing that it's there. Micromobility, uh, not having that heavy infrastructure lift up front, uh, is able to come in and serve neighborhoods immediately that may not uh, be able to be served. And this is absolutely no way is Blue Bikes bad. That's not what we're saying. We're not here against Blue Bikes. We're not here to compete with Blue Bikes. We're here to expand upon the success that they've shown. We know people will ride these micromobility vehicles. We know they'll be successful, and we know they'll integrate themselves into uh, the fabric of the city uh, very deeply, and we're looking forward to, uh, to working with you, continue to get to that spring pilot, hopefully, where we can show what these things can do. Thank you. Thank you. You can go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, I did prepare a brief uh, written statement. I also brought um, all of the council members should have um, a deck that I brought along as well that has some visuals. I know it's always helpful to see the scooters in person, um, so feel free to flip along with me, uh, should you choose. 
Um, the good morning, counselors. Good afternoon. My name is Hannah Smith, and I'm a government relations manager at Bird. Um, if you'll go to the third page, uh, in more than 100 cities around the world, we are proudly helping visionary governments advance their goals of reducing traffic and carbon emissions. In just one year of operation, we've seen the incredible impact that Bird can have on a city, and we believe that Boston would be no different. 40% of car trips in America are less than three miles long. People should not have to get in a car or use a ride hailing company to have to move such a short distance. Those trips worsen traffic and pollution, and they are entirely avoidable. Bird is a perfect solution for eliminating those short car trips and is something that we have already seen across the board given that the average bird ride is a mile and a half long. We at Bird are obsessed with safety, and although it is well known that cars are the most dangerous vehicle on any road, we understand that e-scooters are new and require a high standard of safety as communities adjust to their presence. Research also proves time and time again that there is safety in numbers. So the more non-car vehicles, such as bikes and scooters that there are on the road, the safer these cyclists and riders will be. In short, the fewer cars, the better. Bird wants to make it easier for people to move around, which is only possible when roads and sidewalks are safe and inclusive of everyone. We initiated the industry-leading Save Our Sidewalks pledge to demonstrate our company's interest in being good partners with the city in which we operate and to ensure that our service is respectful of the public right-of-way. Okay. As part of this pledge, birds are collected every single night for charging and inspection, which helps us maintain a healthy fleet for our riders and ensures that our scooters aren't on the road at night when collisions are more likely. We also do this daily pickup to ensure that vehicles are consistently repositioned to reduce clutter on sidewalks and parked safely and out of the public's right of way. This pledge also commits Bird to increasing the number of vehicles in markets only when every vehicle on the road is being used an average of at least three times per day. We remove vehicles when they are underutilized to ensure that supply truly meets demand. Lastly, the Save Our Sidewalks pledge promises to remit $1 per, $1 per vehicle per day in the, to the city governments so that we can make and build more bike lanes and invest in the kind of infrastructure that we need to meet our shared goals of getting cars off the road and promoting environmentally friendly transportation. Bird hopes to be a good partner to Boston, working together to advance our shared goals of building cleaner, safer, smarter streets. We recently launched our GovTech platform to formalize our commitment to working closely with the cities in which we operate. Through this platform, we will share anonymized data with city officials and work together to improve our technology so that Boston is best served by Bird. In addition to technological support, Bird will make every effort to provide on-the-ground support through community outreach and in-person interactions. Where possible, Bird can host helmet giveaways and safety events, partner with local business organizations, and offer in-person support for officials as we continue to solidify our partnership. We also recently launched our Bird Watchers program, a team of local individuals who provide on-the-ground support in cities. They promote the safe parking of birds, readjust parked vehicles when necessary, and keep the public right-of-way clear. This is going to be a great option for Boston one day. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak on Bird's behalf, and I'd be happy to take any questions uh, once my partner at Lyft uh, provides testimony. Sounds good. Thank you. Good morning. Good, morning. Uh, good afternoon, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Miller Nuttall. I'm a senior manager of bike and pedestrian policy at Lyft. We really appreciate uh, y'all taking the time to organize this hearing and for inviting us to participate, so thank you. Um, we're excited to engage in this conversation about the future of dockless mobility in Boston uh, and to share some of the guiding principles that guide our work in this space. Uh, before I dive in, I imagine some of you are surprised by our recent growth into the bike and scooter business, so it's worth spending a little time addressing our thinking around that matter. Um, as someone who spent my entire career uh, working for nonprofit bike and pedestrian advocacy organizations, I was intrigued by that move as well. Um, I hope I can shed some light on why we see bikes and scooters as integral to our mission of providing the world's best transportation. Our vision is for cities designed around people, not cars. Achieving that vision will mean making long-term investments in infrastructure to keep everyone safe, things like protected bike lanes, safer crosswalk, even car-free areas that put pedestrians first. Lyft fully supports these interventions and looks forward to working with you to make them a reality in neighborhoods across Boston. We also support adding more options for how people get around our streets and using our technology <coughs> to make choosing the healthiest, greenest, and safe and most efficient mode of transportation as easy as possible. Bikes, scooters, and transit can serve the lion's share of short trips in our cities far more efficiently than cars, and we are excited to meet that demand, even if it means taking some trips away from our ride-sharing business. Four principles will guide our approach to bikes and scooters in Boston and throughout the country. Equity, streets designed for people, 
transit integration, and environmental sustainability. First and foremost, we are committed to deploying bikes and scooters in neighborhoods that need them most, from transit deserts to low-income communities, where the cost of car ownership can severely curtail residents' transportation options. We will offer, deep, we will offer deeply discounted passes to low-income residents throughout the city to ensure access is equitable and fair, and partner with local non-for-profit organizations to hold us accountable to delivering equitable service. Second, we support reclaiming space on our streets for people walking, biking, scooting, and taking public transit. The full promise of micro-mobility micro can only be realized if we dedicate enough protected space to the, these new modes to make navigating our streets on two wheels or on two feet as natural and safe as hopping in a car. Third, we believe in integrating our bike and scooter systems with public transportation. We're already doing this on the ground in Santa Monica, where our partnerships with Big Blue Bus allows our users to complete the first and last mile trip of a transit trip by scooter and compare the cost and time saving of a scooter or bus trip versus a rideshare trip. We're rolling this function functionality out in cities across the country in the coming weeks and months. Finally, environmental sustainability shapes all of our systems. Aside from our work deploying scooters and bikes across the country, we now offset carbon emissions from every one of our rideshare trips, making us uh, one of the largest voluntary purchasers of credit offsets in the world. We are keen to explore the potential for dockless scooters in Boston, and even more excited to open a bigger discussion about how micro-mobility of all sorts can help accelerate the push for safer, more sustainable, more sustainable streets. Um, before I wrap up, I'd like to express our support for the public-private partnership that Motivate has formed with the City of Boston through the Blue Bike system. As you likely know, uh, we've agreed to acquire Motivate and are excited to upgrade and expand the current system in close coordination with Boston and other municipalities after the acquisition process concludes. When it comes to bikes, we've done our research and taken our time choosing a partner for this work. And the reason we've chosen to acquire Motivate and their system and is because we believe the only way for bike share to work in cities at scale is with their docked model. Blue Bike's docked bike share system provides reliable bike share service that makes optimal use of precious street space and sidewalk space. This model is working and we will invest additional resources to make sure we achieve operational excellence and high customer satisfaction and work with the city to innovate hardware to stay at the cutting edge of the industry. In the meantime, we're excited to dis discuss how Lyft can add further value with scooters in Boston and think through what the future of micro-mobility holds for the city. Thanks again for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Uh, thank you all, and, and, and through you, Madam Chair, I know I invited Spin just to be clear. Are there any other uh, electric scooter companies represented that would like to join this panel? I don't believe so, but just in case I missed anybody. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you all for your presentation and uh, for joining us this afternoon. I guess um, briefly, Mr. Nettle, we'll start with you and just go down. I have a couple questions um, uh, for all of you to answer. So how many cities, so, so Lyft, does operate some electric scooters. How many, which cities are you in we currently? Are, and then uh, we'll go down the line. Sure, uh, so it's a nascent part of our business. We're yeah. in Denver and Santa Monica so far, and uh, we'll be in 10 cities by the end of the year. That's great. Yeah. And, and uh, since I have you here, I believe Lyft was giving free rides to the polls uh, not too long ago in certain cities, so I appreciate that for to get yeah, more people active. Yeah, coming up this year too. That's yeah. terrific, that's yeah. terrific. Thank you. Uh, Bird is in over 100 cities worldwide, uh, and we also are doing a GOTV effort, I think, Excellent. echoing the support of everybody in this room. <laughs> great, great. And can you tell, I mean, I, I, don't, I would assume it's not proprietary. Can you share which some of those cities are that you're currently in in the United States? Yeah, so we, we launched in Santa Monica first, um, have spread uh, throughout Southern California, working our way uh, east. We're in Washington, D.C. We're in Paris. We're in Tel Aviv, um, a few other cities wow. in Western Europe. We recently launched in Mexico City. I'm hoping to come to Massachusetts soon. Great, thank you. We uh, uh, founded our company in January of 2017 as Lime Bike. Uh, we rebranded about seven months ago to Lime. We always knew we were going to do that because we're building a mobility company with multiple modes. Uh, we have bicycles, we have electric bicycles, and we have electric scooters. We operate more than 100, I, I, I hesitate to give a number because it probably changed. We just launched two in New Zealand last night wow. while I was asleep. 
Uh, we're also in Mexico. We moved into Canada a couple weeks ago. Uh, I personally personally launched Lansing East Lansing and MSU uh, a week and a half ago. Uh, it's, it's what we call Lime Time. We're moving very very quickly, and that's because people ride these vehicles, uh, and it's it's very exciting. Um, but we are uh, uh, currently operating in Metro Boston, uh, as you mentioned, just a, across the border without scooters right now. But we are having those conversations. Uh, but we have thousands of bicycles and electric bicycles as part of a regional coordinated network. It was an RFP through MAPC last fall uh, that we were awarded. Okay. Great. And can you talk a little bit about, um, and I guess Hannah will start with you and just I'll start with each of you with <laughs> these questions. Uh, you touched upon it in your opening, but, but some of the benefits, and I want to be clear about this, part of my support for sort of new innovation technology, particularly as it relates to transportation, is that of course it's good for the environment, which is important. Of course it's good for easing congestion, which is important. Of course it's good for public health, mental health, which is important. Of course, it's good for serving transit deserts, very, very important. It can also benefit in, in a public-private partnership, which is what we're talking about today, it can very much benefit the municipality. So Hannah, we'll start with you. Talk about, you talked about, um, I think, so, some uh, revenue sharing or some things that you have been able to do, or the company has done with other cities to make it uh, a strong and productive partnership. Yeah, it is, it's a very exciting market to be in, and I'm sure that um, the other companies at the table will, uh, will agree. So Bird has done a few things. The first is we do share our revenue with the cities that we operate in. Um, we uh, recently partnered with the city of Santa Monica to uh, create a parklet that they're really excited about. We've given away over 50,000 free helmets in our first year of operation alone. Um, there, there are a lot. We do helmet giveaways with local businesses. We do safety trainings. Um, and additionally, I mentioned um, our bird watchers program, which has been a huge benefit to cities in terms of fleet maintenance and operation. So these are people who are literally patrolling streets and, you know, this is a situation where we'd work with BTD or a similar, um, you know, sort of uh, enforcement agency uh, to make sure that these high traffic and crunched areas are actually working as seamlessly as we know that they can. Um, we also have safety ambassadors who can come out uh, to other high profile events. I'm thinking of parades and fairs in Boston, even things like the head of the Charles, which I know is coming up that's, that has a lot of people sure. and I'm sure that scooters, you know, hopefully will be in, in high use there next year. Um, but there, there's a lot that we want to do and we care a lot about the cities that we operate in. Um, and is Santa Monica, excuse me, uh, yeah. is that a, uh, the revenue sharing a dollar per day per vehicle? Mm -hmm. So what does that translate yes, to? Yes, correct. Too. Um, so it changes based on fleet size, yeah. uh, but it, you know, is at least a couple hundred thousand dollars a year for cities that can be used towards uh, shared infrastructure. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. So, as I mentioned, collaboration is really the DNA of our of our company, um, and we go in and we we do sometimes months long groundwork uh, to to set the table, so to speak, for maximum impact. And we know that uh, we can't have uh, the biggest mode shift uh, unless we're working with cities on shared sure. goals, and it really is uh, um, uh, fundamental to us. Um, you know, when cities, it's interesting when we first approached the cities around the MAPC. Uh, RFP last year, it was like, wait a minute, you're going to bring us free bike share? We don't have to pay for this? We, we were just quoted $700,000 for this other system. What, what do you mean? It's like, well, our, our skin in the game is we'll bring the vehicles because we know people will use them. We'll operate them to a very high standard with very experienced people. Um, but the skin in the game for a city should be to build that infrastructure or at the very least pilot that infrastructure, right? But when it gets into this uh, conversation now, moving into the spring, it's more like, well, what are you going to do for us? And, you know, we would fundamentally shift the conversation away from us coming in and uh, having to pay cities to build infrastructure that our vehicles and other vehicles will then use. This should be a partnership that goes both ways and we really need to look five years out and say, what are we going to move towards rather than uh, this sort of knee-jerk reaction because it, it went from one dollar per scooter per day to, and you're probably hearing the same thing, to $365 per scooter just to come in, a check up front. So it, it, these barriers are sort of floating around. And so I would encourage that when we talk about partnership, we don't talk about money exchanging hands because we don't ask for any from the city. Uh, certainly permit fees are one thing and, and license fees, but it, it just, we go down a slippery slope and when you see uh, a Midwest city say, oh, and we want a $5,000 kicker up front. So it gets in the way a little bit, um, and I think the partnership should be around uh, sharing the data that we have on our more than 13 and a half million trips that we've logged since June of last year. We collect all that data. We have a data dashboard that our partners have access to on day one 
uh, and they can see where these vehicles are going and they can make better planning decisions based on that. So uh, again, when you think public-private partnership, it's important to sort of like, let's, let's take money out of this, that, that muddies things, and it keeps us away from our vision of actually getting where we both want to be, uh, which is to a, a more sustainable future. Mr. Nuttall? Yeah, so I think one of the really exciting opportunities about micromobility is connections to transit and how we use this new transportation option to bolster the really great public transit systems that already exist and amplify the, the capacity that they have to, to carry more people around town. Um, I think all of, all of the operators provide that service and some of the data that's coming out of cities is really impressive about just how many trips are being made to a bus stop, to a subway stop. So we're excited to build on that. I think. Lyft can offer some additional value in terms of integrated trip planning. So we now have the ability, um, people can reserve scooters through our app so you can get on the bus and plan this trip in the Lyft app, get on the bus, reserve a scooter ahead of time so you have a seamless transportation experience. Um, and I think that's something that can further motivate people. Just curious on the mechanics of that, will yeah. a scooter be delivered to a particular bus stop or do you have to plan the bus trip around where the scooter may be? The idea is that the scooter saturation is high enough that there's always gotcha. a scooter at, a, at the end of a bus stop. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, you have to look and verify there's yeah. actually one there waiting for you, but then you can reserve it ahead of time so you know that it's there. Um, just making it a little easier, incentivizing people to take public transit instead of even taking a rideshare trip or their personal car trip. So I think that's one area where we're really excited to add additional value. Um, the other is that we obviously, you know, my background is in bicycle advocacy and pedestrian advocacy. We want to use this moment, this explosion in, in ridership on, on bikes and scooters as an opportunity to accelerate the infrastructure that y'all are already building out around town. So I, th I think, um, you know, furthering however we can, whether it's investments, um, you know, the sort of direct payment to cities, investments in advocacy organizations, using this movement, using this moment to build a movement for protected bike lanes and streets that are truly designed around people. I think that's something that we're really eager to do and, and collaborate with various stakeholders to make that happen. So I mean, if I have this right and correct me, I think you've all very nicely sort of talked about the public good and what can come of this and, and um, with birds specifically in terms of, you know, helmet giveaways and revenue sharing that can then go to parklets or, or other things. Uh, with Lime, more of a focus on data sharing uh, and planning things out and then with, with Lyft, also some sort of revenue upfront payments that would then go into infrastructure for um, scooters, bikes, et cetera. Is that a pretty fair summation of that? Yeah, I, I think sure. so. I mean, uh, it's, it's important though that it's hard for cities sometimes to take money. Uh, where does it go? Does it go into the general fund? Is it, does it really end up flowing through to infrastructure? And the way we approach it is really about building coalitions with existing stakeholders, sure. existing advocacy groups, those uh, uh, doing outreach in the community. Rather than us coming in and reinventing the wheel, we're empowering people that do good work. Sure. Okay. And, and through our Lime, um, we have a donation program now called Lime Hero, where uh, users can actually round up and donate to a local advocacy group at the end of their trip. Uh, again, empowering the local sure. groups that are doing it rather than us coming in from sure. above. Okay, and so in the first panel, it was gratifying from my perspective to hear that there seems to be a real agreement afoot that this uh, ought to be part of our conversation as it relates to micromobility, and there's a desire to uh, work together collaboratively uh, with initially the other uh, municipalities that are involved in our bike share and our Motivate sort of program, um, and then perhaps and hopefully in my from my perspective, looking at more of the 15 sort of MAPC cities and towns that are working with some of you or others. Um, have you had experiences, and it also seems to me that rather than doing the, you know, uh, Director Seskin made the distinction that the bike share pro program as it relates to blue bikes is a city run program with, with uh, Motivate as sort of the uh, operator, whereas this would be different the way it's at least being conceived right now this pilot program would be sort of permitted and all companies that were interested and able to work, so long as a series of guidelines presumably were met, would be able to partake and there'd be a certain number of, the way I understood it, there'd be a certain, a certain number of uh, uh, scooters allowed in. Does that, is that a system that gives any of you pause? Do you think that's a good approach to you? Do, is this what some other cities have done? Just feel free to speak, you know, honestly, and, and we can start with you, Mr. Mullen. Well, thank you. I mean, in my experience, actually, after uh, launching 
uh, Hubway, now Blue Bikes, in Boston uh, with 610 bikes in the first year, it was the following year that we expanded into Cambridge and, and Brookline and Somerville. Um, so, you know, regionality is, uh, is key to any network. You don't want to build borders. You don't want to build walls. These vehicles are going to go where they go. Uh, so you want to make sure that everybody's happy with that. Um, I would push back on one thing that, that Director Seskin said. Uh, it's important that we classify what these vehicles are, uh, these new micromobility vehicles in, in uh, state ordinance, uh, but maybe not necessarily uh, dictate where they can operate. It really, every city is a little bit different and, and cities are, are not going to want to preemptively give up their uh, ability to manage their right of way. Uh, and we don't support that. We, we support uh, city control of their own right of way. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do like one common classification. Uh, it's an important distinction to make. Okay. Um, do you want to, well, again, everyone can answer this question, sort of thoughts on the, what you heard earlier today, mm -hmm. um, is that an approach that has worked with your company elsewhere? Are there concerns? Are there benefits to it? Yeah. Uh, generally, I think it's the model that's being used in cities across the country. I think it's a good, good way to, to test out these services and make sure that the right stakeholders are engaged. I think a collaborative process of drafting, you know, this opening dialogue <laughs> is part of a bigger process of coming up with those standards so that we can ensure equitable access, so we can ensure um, you know, sustainability, all the goals that the city has to make the program successful, um, you know, a, a big enough cap so that we can actually get ridership numbers up for everyone uh, and sort of parity between the different operators so that there's a level playing field. I think those are some principles that we're excited about, um, but overall the process sounds good. Good, okay. Yeah, it sounds good. And I think, uh, Councillor Wu, uh, to talk to some of your concerns that you were touching on earlier about requiring equity plans and some of the benefits that the sort of really robust RFPs require is um, a lot of the permitting applications that we're seeing require similar things. Our permit that typically ends up that the regs are sort of generally broad, but the, the permitting requirements are very, very specific and do require the companies to provide the information that is important to you guys to make those decisions with through a lens of, of equity and advocacy. Um, and then I want to be respectful for my colleagues, so maybe one, one more question, for, although I think you're the only colleague. Now. So you can go and then I'll come back if yeah. you want. So I'll, I'll see to you, but then I'll come back for a second round. Sure, Please, of course. Okay. Um, so I'm just curious, since we have you all here uh, to get your input on the uh, sort of rules that should go into this pilot round, what do you think the speed limit should be? For so we cap all of our vehicles at 15 miles an hour, and we do that intentionally, and that seems to, to be working well. And that's 14.8 for ours, and, and we have the ability to go down. Uh, these are all updatable over the air, um, but typically it's 14.8. It's so you'd be, able to, you'd be able to actually cap the vehicle at a lower speed? We too. could control that, yeah. Is it true that NACTO has, has been talking about 12 or a lower number than 14? I'm not 100% sure on okay. that. Okay. All right. Um, what about the, what, what's your best suggestion for what a sort of minimum scale would be in terms of number of vehicles to have a successful pilot? Well, I think um, I'm hearing a lot of positive stuff happening. I mean, obviously, saturation is a great word, and, and being able to dial back and up, up and down the, the demand, dynamic caps. That really matters, because if, if a city says, well, we'll take them, but we'll only take 500, where's that number coming from? Uh, it has to be tied to something. Um, and the beauty of these systems is that they reset themselves every night, and they come back out uh, the very next day. And, and so the, the ability to control and ratchet up or down is... So what is number would you suggest we start at? Oh, in, in Boston? If we were just going to say the entire city, yeah. we're talking in the thousands, okay. yeah, for, for vehicles. Does that sound about right to you all, given your other cities? Yeah, coverage? I think to start, again, and I think that you guys get this, like, it's all about utilization, and we'll learn more as, as we operate more, um, but that seems adequate. It seems like the range, yeah. There's, it's thousands the like 2,000, or thousands like 12,000. Well, I, the RFP that I answered for the regional system for bicycles in the 15 cities uh, surrounding um, was for 5,100 5, to start, 8,900 at saturation for bicycles, and that's in, in Metro Boston. That's not even in the densest parts of downtown. So I would put it somewhere in the 5 to 10 range would be uh, for a single company is, is something I think could serve. And again, this is about re reliable uh, transportation. This isn't selling ice cream cones by Fenway, right? This is getting people to work and, and to school uh, on time. I think good? that range sounds good to us too. It's, it's one of those counterintuitive bike share rules, you know, that the, the 
the bigger you make the system, the more people use it. Um, and so even per unit, so I think getting to a certain threshold of scale is important. Okay. And are you, are, are you willing to geofence parking, geo, basically take certain streets off of the, you know, remove the ability for scooters to be parked on certain streets given either they're very narrow or other considerations on, on the sidewalk or things we like that? We have various ways we can control parking and geofencing is one of them. Um, we would have to work closely with the city on that. Um, I think it's important that, you know, not every uh, block is going to need a painted spot to put scooters, uh, but some are. In Downtown Crossing, for example, you can't just let it be a free-for-all in Downtown Crossing. Uh, but as you move out um, um, to some, some other neighborhoods, you'll really lose the power of dockless if you make it sort of dock light. Mm -hmm. And okay, you can only put it over here because you heard about first last mile, transportation, connections to transit and such. This is first last 10 feet. As long as you park it responsibly, you can leave it wherever is, is, uh, has enough space. Um, we do uh, require, before you end a scooter trip, you have to take a photo of how you're parking it. And that re reinforces, you know you're gonna be judged on it, number one, so you're gonna make sure it looks as good as you can. Number two, we gamify that, and anyone, whether they use our, our um, vehicles or not, has access to our free smartphone app and can use the parked or not feature and just flip through and say, yeah, that's parked or no, that's not. Mm -hmm. So it's another way to reinforce it. But what we're really doing is gathering data to tr uh, train our learning algorithms to do that uh, analysis for us. Because as we scale to 50,000 vehicles, to 500,000 vehicles, we don't have enough eyeballs to look at all those uh, photos. So we want to do the initial screen by computer and then put our, our customer service techs on it. Great. Yeah, I would say it's one of the many levers that we can pull. Um, you know, this is, I think that the thing that is of the most important to us is making sure that we're maintaining that four feet of unobstructed sidewalk access that everybody needs um, and being ADA compliant and, and working with the Disability Commission and everything else that we can do to make sure that people are all using our streets. Um, you know, we have we have similar programs in our app. We now have a new um, community mode in our app where it allows you to report poorly parked scooters. Um, our bird watchers are obviously on the ground every day moving and reallocating. Um, we're seeing in other cities like Indianapolis has a really good designated um, dockless parking system uh, that they've done. Nashville has done similar things. Um, but yeah, geofencing is certainly like one of those tools in our two blocks. Okay. Yeah. Ditto for geofencing, yeah. definitely. And, um, <laughs> yeah, and we, we have a, a team of field staff who are solely responsible for making sure these are parked safely and we do that in-house and empower them to act quickly um, to make sure that they're not blocking a sidewalk for more than a lot of cities are doing two hours. I think just a reasonable time frame to get them out of the way as quickly as possible. Okay. Um, could you each talk a little bit about diversity and inclusion in your staffing up in cities and what do the demographics look like when you're hiring or when you have hired in, in other cities, do you hire locally? What is the racial demographic of makeup of your leadership teams, et cetera? Uh, that's a great question. I don't have the data uh, specifically, but I will say we do hire locally everywhere that we go. We hire a local market leader, someone who knows that market best. I'll say for the regional bike system that we're operating, again, at, at the border, um, we have several Spanish language speakers that do outreach um, specifically to target communities. We've actually branded our bicycles either um, full-on Spanish or in English and Spanish. Uh, both up here, we've done that in the Hartford market as well. Uh, but our teams range anywhere for, if we uh, are going to plop down a 300 scooter uh, market, that's 10 to 12 full-time jobs, uh, including scooter mechanics and scooter uh, rebalancers and, and chargers. Uh, we do partially outsource the charging, and this is sort of, um, uh, gives us the ability to, to flexibly scale up and down. Again, if we get the go-ahead, we're in Detroit with 400 scooters. If we get the go-ahead to go to 4,000, we can't hire enough people. Uh, we're finding uh, labor markets are very tight. Um, but for the basic function of charging, uh, we are able to outsource that to Lime Juicers. There are users who are supplementing their transportation costs with taking a scooter home and charging it. Uh, and we've met with them, we've given them a safety training, we've given them the proper charger with which to do that. And if they want to scale it up to 10 or 12 scooters, they can do that. So it's sort of a side hustle employment beyond the sort of full timers that we already hire. Um, similarly, I don't have our uh, hiring demographic data in front of me. I'm happy to follow up with you on it. Um, but we do hire locally, take diversity and inclusion incredibly seriously. I am very aware of the hiring and inclusion uh, requirements that Boston has for a lot of its programs, and that's something that we're already thinking about here. Uh, ditto. We take 
diversity and inclusion extremely seriously. Uh, we hire locally in every one of the cities where we're operating. Um, Lyft just recently released its report, its own internal numbers on diversity and inclusion efforts. And so there, there's a conscious effort from the very top of the company to have daylight and accountability on our hiring practices so that we can hold ourselves internally to making hiring decisions that uh, reflect diversity and inclusion. Could I just add one more point on that? Because it goes far beyond the hire, right? Uh, when we were launching Hartford, Connecticut, which we launched in the beginning of June of this year, we had the options of a few different warehouses, really cheap ones down by the, the airport south of town. And if you choose that, so we can save a buck on a lease cost, you're basically condemning anyone who's dry, who, who is going to work for you to have to have a car to get down there. There is no bus that gets there. What we ended up doing was taking a space, a warehouse space, just off the fast track, which is this beautiful bus rapid transit, serves multiple communities, goes right into downtown Hartford and back out the other end. Um, and we're paying a lot more for it, but that's how half of our staff get to work every day. It's by public transit. So it's just important. You have to think about this sort of in a larger, a larger ecosystem. But, uh, but yeah, I can, I can follow up uh, and get you that yeah, information. I would love to, to see that. And it just the reason I ask is because the cities, I think as Hannah referenced, the city's uh, rules are that companies that we contract with directly or even have an RFP uh, to potentially solicit any sort of business or relationship are uh, required to submit a diversity inclusion plan, and that is required to be part of the eval oh, hi, Councilor um, uh, part of the evaluation of that partnership and relationship. So, even though this is technically, you know, there would be no direct payments, um, you are all essentially hoping to be just as functioning in the same role as many of our other city partners would be, and, and that's extremely important to us. Um, Okay, I apologize, Councilor Siomo. I, I hope you haven't been sitting there long and I didn't see you. Okay, um, so we will go to Councilor Siomo for questions, and then I know Councilor Malley has a follow up too. Um, I just wanted to come and say thank you for sponsoring this hearing. Um, I had the opportunity to meet with some folks. Um, uh, I got briefed by my staff earlier today. I think most of the important questions were asked about, you know, sidewalk accessibility, cluttering, all those issues that, that we discussed. But I think it's an exciting opportunity for us to add more uh, modes of transportation to our streets. I would venture to guess that my area would be a very desirable one to have them. But again, you know, we're caught, we want to be cautious, and I'm glad that we're. Uh, out in front of this, so I want to thank you both for sponsoring the hearing. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Siomo. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so just walk me through this. I think I have it, but because they're electric and need to be charged, all of the scooters are picked up every night by either staff or some have programs or it could be a user will bring it home, but they're all charged overnight. So these are taken off, these are taken off of city streets from, do certain cities or towns have times they need to be picked up? Is it determined by your company. We're going to pick them up at 10 o'clock. We're going to pick them up at midnight. I think that's something that you could lay out in the ordinance okay. permitting. Structure. So some cities would say after 10 p.m. these need to be removed from the streets. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah I correct. think the most important thing is that we cover evening commutes, uh, yeah, exactly. right? You, you just actually want to provide a transportation service. Uh, but beyond that, I know uh, Bird makes a decision to pull scooters off the street around 9 p.m. each night. Um, other cities have actually set start stop times. Okay. Yeah. And then they are brought presumably to a w I'm just thinking what you would need to be up and operational. You would need to have a, a warehouse, you need to have some office space where you could charge them. That's correct. Right. It's typically a warehouse and a like a fleet manager, someone who operationally is empowered to make decisions on the ground. Um, Bird also hires um, full-time community managers as well uh, to to be that face and that person on the ground. Yep. Um, and then we have bird watchers additionally. Okay. And, the, and I assume, so you talked about yeah. the same thing with Lime, you charge them at a warehouse or you have the users take them. Correct. It's, it's a nodal network, so yeah. it's not necessarily one central warehouse in one part of town. It's, it's juice bars, whatever you want to call and do them. Any, have any of you started, you don't have to share this if you don't want to, but <laughs> have any of you started looking at real estate? I guess I'm thinking about what is, is a spring, will, you, will all of your companies be able to participate in a spring pilot program? Yes. Okay. yes. We Absolutely. Have a, if not sooner. Okay. Yeah. And there are um, staff that you need to also bring in. I think someone had said it's about 10, 10 person staff per city. Is that about right? For 300 scooter fleet is how we 10 to 12. That's okay. how we manage it, yeah. Okay. Uh, did you want to say something? No, I was just going to say it depends on the size of the We scale with the Perfect. size of Perfect. Units. And then they are deployed by the same t uh, members the next morning, and you will sort of have a good idea about 
where the deployment are needed or is needed, I should say. You, yes, we've done the groundwork to uh, um, talk to local businesses because if we're going to be putting something in front of their store, most are very supportive. Yeah. Uh, but they at least need to be aware. Um, but those hot spots, as we call them, uh, can shift with demand and time, and so we're very flexible and say, well, this one isn't really working, and we think it should be half a block down, okay. that sort of stuff. Okay. Yeah. And it's it's a very dynamic system. Is if Absolutely. no one's picking it up, you can adjust, and conversely, if there's a higher need, you can adjust as well. And has there been any? Um, I guess it may be difficult to exactly get, but can you estimate the percentage of car trips that have been replaced by scooters in the cities that you're currently operating in? I don't have an exact figure. Uh, what I can say is we analyzed our uh, first year of trips, was, which was about 10 million trips. Um, maybe about half of those were scooter, a little less than half. Now we're up over 50% scooter trips. 28% um, connected to transit. Uh, either at the start or the end of a trip. Um, we've done surveys and, and uh, to try to suss out that number of how much of these are offset car trips um, and TNCs specifically. So we're, we're going to do a deeper dive on that yeah. because I think that's the real power here is, is getting cars out of downtown when you don't need them for those very short trips. Um, but with scooters, we're seeing there's a lot of recreational trips. These are just fun. Yeah. Um, but we're also seeing a, like a 5X uh, factor uh, more than our bicycles being ridden. So uh, many, many more trips and a portion of that is, is more recreational as well. But we're, okay. we're dialing in on that number now okay. because we know it's powerful. Sure. Does anyone else want to add on that? Or I know Yeah, I know. Um, so we have a research team that is working on getting hard data for that presently, which I'll follow up with you on. Um, I do know that for every one mile that our scooters travel that cars do not, that is a pound of carbon emissions that we save um, from being emitted into the atmosphere. Uh, so for our first year of operation, um, we believe that we saved 12.7 million pounds of carbon emissions, uh, which we're thrilled about. Correct. Yeah. Um, we don't have exact numbers either, but we're looking at the, the you know, the percentage of our rideshare trips, for instance, that are one or two miles um, are very easily capturable by a scooter or bike. Um, and so our, our strategy is to shift, obviously, private car trips first, you know, single occupancy vehicles. We want people out of their those cars the least efficient use of space possible and on a bike or a scooter. Um, but we see a huge opportunity among just shorter trips around town as well. Okay. And again, I know that this is such a new technology that you may not have answers to these questions, but I, I believe all of you have said or have said elsewhere that there are incentives for low income riders to uh, be able to take advantage of this program at a discounted rate. Can you talk a little bit maybe briefly upon, uh, expounding upon that and then also what you've seen that how this can benefit a low-income person or low-income parts of the city? Yeah, I think it's important. Um, what we learned when we did our pilot uh, with bicycles in um, Malden last fall, we were seeing trip patterns that we, we had never seen before. And these are starting at midnight, going deep, deep, deep in the industrial parts of Chelsea uh, and coming back out at 7 or 7.30 in the morning. Uh, same with the Gateway Center to the Home Depot. There's always a few line bikes behind there uh, for the overnight restock shifts. Um, so uh, there, there's power there, and it's always dockless mobility is, has always been seen as sort of another option for people who have other options, and it's just like, oh, this is the most convenient one for me right now, and it really matters that you, you uh, are able to serve uh, those who don't have um, uh, any other options. We have a program called Lime Access, um, and you can pay. We're knocking down the traditional barriers of smartphone and uh, bank account or credit card. Mm -hmm. uh, some people don't have access to those. Uh, so through the Pay Near Me network, you're uh, able to top off your Lime account for $5. Uh, that will get you 100 trip credits on our pedal bikes. Um, and you can create an account with a phone number and text simply do SMS to unlock that vehicle. $5 will get 100. 100 trip credits on our pedal classic pedal right. bicycle. Now we have expanded that Lime Access program to be a 50% discount off of our electric products, so our e-bikes and our electric gotcha. scooters. Okay. Good. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Yeah. So I think um, Scott did a really good job of touching on the transportation equity access part of this, right? The benefit of these programs is that we can go where infrastructure isn't, and we are nimble and flexible and can, and can fill those gaps. I think more specifically, uh, we're similarly working on a text-to-access program. Uh, we have lots of language access capabilities. Uh, and then our actual payment structure is that, um, and we only do scooters. Uh, we're the only company that just has e-scooters. Um, but our fee structure is it's a dollar base fare and 15 cents a minute. And then our one bird program waives that dollar base fare for anybody who is enrolled in or eligible for any type of social assistance. Um, and our, our entryway to that is, is very vague. We just
just ask that you mail some type of proof. We don't classify which, and then we will apply that credit to your account, and it will be there forever, no questions asked. Um, we also do the same for veterans. It's called our Red, White, and Bird program. Okay, thank you. Uh, I know. <laughs> the, <puns. laughs> the, 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 the bird word. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, ditto. Um, for in terms of the benefits of this this technology for alleviating the transportation costs, I'm sure you've heard the statistics. You know, upwards of 40 percent of a typical household income, a low income household, can go to transportation. Sure. So yeah. if there's the possibility to um, alleviate that that burden, uh, this is a huge opportunity. Especially if you can get rid of a car, which costs about ten thousand dollars a year to own and maintain. Um, and our community, we have a community pass, is what it's called at Lyft. It's $5 for the first year and then $5 a month thereafter. Um, and so similar, that gives you unlimited access to our uh, bikes and scooters. For the first year, $5 unlimited bikes and scooters. Yeah. Wow, that's fantastic. Okay. Um, and then we, um, I, I have a sort of a, a question and then my final sort of comment. Uh, the question being, how do you work, and if you can just be brief on this, because we have one more panel to get to, when you deal with the city's uh, constituent complaints. We have a system all of you know here in Boston called 311 where I have seen many dockless bikes on it already. I've, I've been called on them. How does it work with working with other municipalities you may be in um, when a city is asked for you know assistance in either cleaning, clearing something up, removing something, et cetera? So anyone want to? So, so our team can move the bikes or scooters, in this case it would be scooters, very quickly. Um, and so there's a phone number listed on every single device. Uh, there's in-app, there's in-app communications channels with customer service or a way to complain about it. I'm sorry though, but do you work with cities on that? In other words, if, if a city has a system in place, I know we have some folks from New Arbor Mechanics, would oh, they be yeah. able to work directly? Absolutely, yeah, and we'd respond to their requests as quickly as possible. Does that exist currently? Uh, we have a way in the cities where we're working now where the city can contact us and then Correct. deploy our operations okay, team perfect. to go fix That's it. That's what I'm looking for. Great. Yeah, I think similarly, um, I'm very familiar with 311 both here and in New York City uh, where I've worked on it from the city side. Uh, I believe that we are building a pathway that allows those complaints with the city's permission and, and the right level of cooperation for those complaints to be threaded directly to us right. and we deal with it in the same way. But I think similarly we ask for two hours to respond to any complaint. It's typically much, much, much quicker than that um, to, to make sure that everything is where it's supposed to be when it's supposed to be there. Great. Thank you. We are currently integrated both in 311 and C -click Fix around the region. Mm -hmm. Including Boston 311? Uh, no, I don't believe we're integrated with Boston. We don't operate in Boston yet. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that could be a conversation for another day, perhaps. <laughs> and then my last question, I guess, was more of a statement. Um, you know, I, I appreciate this. I, I am very excited about this. I think if done well, we can really write the gold standard uh, across the country in terms of working uh, in both addressing the concerns while offering this very useful um, technology and service to folks um, that may very well benefit uh, the city as well, financially and otherwise. So I guess my last question slash statement to you all is, what have been some challenges that have happened this far with municipalities? So in other words, we right now, working with some incredibly talented people whom you heard from earlier, are working with their partners in other cities and towns to sort of craft, I think, some good guidelines, legislation, oversight, et cetera. What would you caution them to address um, sort of going forward to make sure that we do this right and we do this well. So, Anna, we'll start with you and then the gentleman to your left <laughs> or right. Um, I think that, that some good examples of lessons learned are some of the tools that we have now. So we, we got a lot of complaints about fleet pile up and, and scooter placement, so now we have the bird watcher program to make sure that the cities that we operate in have full-time coverage from us. Uh, you know, we wanted, we got a lot of requests and a lot of feedback about how important and valuable our trip data is, so we built an entire GovTech team whose job it is is specifically to build these technological tools for cities that they need to actually learn and understand the data that we're collecting. Um, you know, I think some of the, the best and most important lessons learned, um, they've already been talked about today, which I'm thrilled to see. The biggest, I believe, is a dynamic cap. Um, where cities are learning that this is a system that, that breathes and it's going to grow a lot over the first few years and they're open to that and finding the best ways to regulate it. Good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, I think it's important, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, a scooter laying down is a bad thing, right? Um, but it's not the worst thing in the world, um, but it's perceived to be. And where we are right now is uh, we tend not to have 
operational issues. What we have are cultural issues um, where people, I, I received just the other day uh, a three page long letter that was typed and it was about uh, our bikes in one of the municipalities around here. And it was from a very passionate person and had very valid points. Towards the end, I should have started at the bottom paragraph, towards the end it said, well, it, it's at the point now I'm seeing about one of these per week that's parked about a foot off. <laughs> I said, okay, this is a letter that took probably an hour to send uh, for an issue that isn't really an issue, but it's perceived to be an issue. And again, we're at the beginning of this here, dockless mobility, it is crucial that we get this right and we have the systems in place that we talked about to mitigate these issues if a scooter tips over, our team knows about it before it's reported to us through tip over technology, all that. But we really are um, uh, pushing cities to help us with some leadership uh, and say, this is the future, we're going here, we're partnering on these goals and measuring those goals and communicating them properly to, uh, to the public. Uh, because again, um, in, in the age of social media, one bad park job becomes 50,000 views, right? And re retweeted without dates and all that. So um, it's important that we get this right uh, and we largely are. Uh, we're not seeing any uh, overwhelming issues. This is a, a great start for micromobility uh, and we're thrilled to be having these conversations. I think one area um, that we're really excited about is providing, we've talked a lot about today, of providing equitable access. And so I think when we're, we're thinking about scoping the size of the service area, being thoughtful about including low-income communities who will most benefit from these services. In some other cities, the pilots are so small geographically and in the number of units that it replicates some of the problematic aspects of bike share, other services that go to the more dense, more affluent areas first and then expand. And so being thoughtful about how to start in areas that need this most alongside the areas with the, the you know, greatest short trip potential would be important. Great. Good. Will all three companies commit to donating uh, helmets to those that wish them once we get to the piloted program? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Thank you all. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, just a question on data that came up. Sure. Um, and a point on the, I, we get calls all the time, and so there's certainly, you know, a range of sort of urgency of constituent requests. But it 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 for every one picture on social media about something that's uh, you know uh, blocking a sidewalk, there's there's probably honestly a hundred that aren't on social media. And so mm -hmm. for for members of the excess for the members of the disability community and others um, who really their their ability to get around the city is made or break, made or broken on accessibility uh, that, I mean that's that's where we have to start as a fundamental baseline so I think any hesitation you hear in terms of concern or, or um, leadership on this is, is just around we want to make sure that the residents often those whose voices are not heard and who are not um, able to come to many of these decision making sessions like this are kind of front and center in, in the conversation um, but just on data since it was brought up, what, uh, so each of you are, are, each of your companies are already sharing data uh, with other cities. How, how frequently does that get reported to the city? It's at the city's request, so it's usually real-time daily. You know, something, something relatively snappy, um, but it's, it's, we build the tools that they need. Uh, that's true as well yeah. for us. Yeah. yeah, our data dashboard looks at yesterday's data and every day prior to that. Uh, we also um, have an API based on the mobility data specification um, that we're sharing. We're actually getting MAPC set up with that right now. And what kinds of data are you you're collecting? Trip, origin, destination? Uh, do you collect demographics on riders or any? what other bits of data are you um, taking in? Uh, I know that we also collect and share um, complaint data that we receive uh, and uh, vehicular inspection data. And um, like you know, the fleet identifying numbers, things like that. Yeah, we don't collect demographic data, uh, but we do collect everything that's in the general bike share feed specification, um, trip origin, trip destination. We actually go one step further and have GPS routes of all the trips, and that's part of the um, um, uh, what's most interesting to cities because they can see where people are riding literally day by day. Not only that, they can see where people are avoiding riding, which is almost uh, almost more important sometimes. Yeah, um, ditto that all of the same information. Uh, I think it's an interesting topic to explore as you all consider the scope of these regulations too, about how to 
Um, I think we all want to be good partners with you in terms of sharing data, especially data that can be aggregated to inform planning decisions, decisions about bike lanes, decisions about pedestrian safety. So how we do that in a way that also protects people's personally identifiable information, um, which is a, a big national conversation that's happening right now. Um, and so I think that's just something to take into account. We, you know, sharing info that will help you without exposing people's privacy. What information does a commuter, a rider need to share to, um, to sign up for the service? Is it just a contact phone number, address, email, or what's required? You do have to share a billing address. Billing address. Uh, because of payment. <laughs> um, yeah, and then um, uh, we, Bird does require that uh, riders are 18 and over, um, and we've done this uh, specifically for safety reasons. Um, we found that it makes the, the riding population um, much more comfortable sharing the roads. Uh, so, but I, I don't believe I'll follow up with you um, on the demographic information that we do actually collect. Um, but I know that, that privacy and personally identifiable information is deeply important to this company and we are working with, like I know Boston has been a leader on making sure that, that they're protecting their citizens' privacy and those vulnerable populations and, and we agree with that. Do any of your companies sell rider data to third parties? No. No. No contact information or anything? No. None. No. Okay, great. All right, thank you very much. Um, we'll do the switch over. Are you good, Councillor Malley? Yes, All you. right, we'll do the switch over thank to our you. last yeah, panel. Appreciate your time. I'm informed that there was no one, no one further signed up for public testimony, but if anyone, we'll take one or two folks who might want to testify in between the panels. Um, if you're interested, just come on down. And in the meantime, we will see Stacy Thompson from Livable Streets and Brendan Kearney from Walk Boston. All right, looks like we're good on public testimony and you both are no strangers to these seats, <laughs> in fact. Uh, so feel free to dive right in. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for having us um, and uh, gathering us for this timely conversation. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Stacey Thompson, Executive Director at Livable Streets Alliance. Um, and generally, my organization would say that shared micromobility options, including bikes, scooters, and whatever may be coming next, because we know we're not stopping with scooters, um, can be useful in an urban setting. However, we need to establish strong but flexible regulation that can respond appropriately to how these technologies evolve. Um, so that's a theme, I think, will bring up a lot strong but flexible um, and in this context you know there as as we're now more than two hours in um, a lot of things we can discuss so I tried to I have some suggestions and a few different buckets I'm going to run through them quickly and then we can chat more if there's something I didn't cover um, but I would say one of the first things to consider is what is the appropriate role and possible burden on municipalities as we continue to partner with more companies like this um, business operations for micromobility companies rely on the use of public space, specifically our streets. Uh, proactively putting in regulation to um, ensure that our cities are not on the hook for dealing with complaints, broken devices, other unforeseen issues is really important. You guys have brought this up. Um, and I would say that this, as you know, has happened to a certain extent, you know, ant bike throwing bikes down. We know that, that we can um, have undue burden. So some of the things to consider are regulating the size of each fleet using dynamic capping. That's come up a lot and we are explicitly in support of that. I would say uh, Louisville, Kentucky, I believe, just um, put together a, a new framework that is worth looking at. I think it's pretty good. Um, I think determining where users are allowed to ride the vehicles and at what speed. Um, you know, I think as we move beyond scooter, something to consider is that there could be mobility options that are different than wheelchairs um, that we want to make sure people can use on a sidewalk that will help our friends who have um, some mobility challenges. So let's not be so restrictive that we can't allow maybe a great option in the future for the folks who we recognize are often under um, under uh, represented in these conversations, but that those mo mobility options should probably go less than five miles an hour on a sidewalk, and that we need safe infrastructure that may accommodate 10 or 15 miles an hour in the way that scooters are, are moving now, and those look a lot like bike lanes, and we know we need a heck of a lot more of those. Um, we can also, I think, need to ensure equitable distribution across neighborhoods, which we've talked about a lot accessibility across multiple languages um, and ensuring that people who need to pay with cash can do so. Um, and then one thing I want to flag is um, 
We are actually very cautious about the revenue sharing model that has been brought up today. I would say so far what I've observed is that it, at best it's a distraction and at worst it can be a sort of boondoggle. Um, if we're talking about $100,000 or $200,000 in the city of Boston, as you both know, approving the budget, that will barely get you paint on the ground. Um, and that, that money could be used um, to ensure that there are people on the ground who redistribute these systems in communities of need that um, do other things that are really important. So I would say um, and again, it can be difficult to figure out who gets that money and ensure that it's distributed properly. So let's not put a lot of time and attention and excitement into a relatively small amount of money when there are bigger fish to fry. Um, second, I'm going to skip over many of my comments on data. Um, we've You've covered almost all of these. Um, I would echo the need for real-time availability, which is happening in the Portland fleet. Um, and collision data and complaint data is really important. And you could also request the percent of individuals individuals who opt into the low-income options. One thing we know from the um, early Hubway deployment is that we had a low-income option, but we didn't advertise it appropriately, and then there was under-usage. So we may want to ask them to report back on who's actually using those options, not just that they offer them. Um, I'm going to just skip, skip, skip. OK. <laughs> and last, uh, but definitely not least, is that the core issues that we've heard today are more related to the state of our streets than the state of this technology. And and without streets that are designed to prioritize the safety of people, permitting regulation will only go so far. We know technology is not going to fix the safety of our streets. Um, Walk Boston will get into this, so I'm going to skip over some of my comments. But I, we would really recommend that, you know, I'm experiencing a sense of urgency in the comments today. Like, can we figure this out by the spring? Um, I can't tell you how many times I have sat in this room asking for parking reform, and we are at a stalemate. Um, and so many of the things that will make make this uh, use of micromobility technology are rooted in the things that are already identified in Go Boston 2030 and our Vision Zero commitment. Um, this includes updating our curbside management policies. Many people are concerned about where we will store these devices and how they will be used. Um, we have plenty of dedicated um, space on our streets, currently parking spaces that could be used for bike racks, um, designated spaces for some of these vehicles, um, and these could be on street corners where we already desperately need daylight for safety reasons. Um, there are many, many other uh, things that we could do in our streets to make it safer, and I'm, I've talked to both of you about them a lot, so I will leave it there. Um, you know, I'm excited that the council is enthusiastic about shared micromobility in the city of Boston, and I hope that you will meet that enthusiasm with um, increased funding and excitement for the infrastructure that will be required to ensure that it's successful. Thank you. And I'm Brennan Carney, Communications Director for Walk Boston. Uh, Walk Boston's position is sidewalks should be reserved for people walking or using mobility assist devices like wheelchairs. If users of micromobility devices are on the sidewalk, however, it's likely the street is unsafe and that really needs to be fixed. We really like how Walk San Francisco framed this discussion, that the greatest threat to pedestrians is, of course, cars and trucks. The potential harm that automobiles can inflict on people is why they work every single day to make their streets and sidewalks safe and make Vision Zero a reality. You know, taking a step backwards, 37 people were killed in car crashes across the U.S. last year. Uh, so far in 2018, over 40 people walking have been hit and killed in Massachusetts. Uh, Walk Boston has a couple of recommendations and things to consider. Uh, cities and towns can most effectively respond to new mobility by rapidly implementing safety improvements that work, as Stacy was talking about and looking for win-win opportunities to advance these mobility goals. You know, redesigning streets to encourage slower speeds, create safe lanes for low speed travel, ensure multi-use paths stay that way. Paths should be off limit to fully motorized vehicles, no matter their fuel source. We recognize these paths are linear parks that double as transportation corridors, but the parks should remain safe and comfortable places for people to enjoy. If electric pedal assist bikes are allowed on multi-use paths, the paths should be low speed, GPS regulated, perhaps at 10 miles per hour. The technology is actually being used now in uh, Western Mass as part of the Valley Bike Share Program in the Pioneer Valley. The, the electric assist bikes are actually, once they're on the GPS, on, on the paths, they're GPS controlled. Um, the, the speed is capped at that time. Um, we also encourage the creation of more bike and scooter parking. So this doesn't just apply to shared. This means bike and scooter parking for everybody so that people have a place to leave bikes and scooters and keep sidewalks and curb ramps clear for people walking, people using wheelchairs, and people with strollers or grocery carts. Uh, 
Stacy could not say curbside management enough. <laughs> like it is a huge issue. Um, but it's not just for bike and scooter parking. It's for delivery zones, short-term drop-off pickup zones, flexible bike scooter parking, food truck spots, home health worker parking, temporarily park it. it it's time. It's time for this. And I think the council knows that. Um, lastly, um, I'm going to rant about traffic signals a little bit because one of the councilors brought up bike signals when she, Councilor Janey, when she was in Seattle. Um, we have great plans for signals in Go Boston 2030, in the Complete Streets Guidelines that were lauded earlier. Um, however, the implementation documents that we give to consultants and we give to people that go out and adjust our signals were just recently updated in July 2018. They're not good. <laughs> they go backwards. They were an update of a 2004 document. It is a great update of that 2004 document, but it doesn't look at what was actually proposed in the Complete Streets Guidelines in Go Boston 2030. I, I can send you guys a letter that we submitted to the Boston Transportation Department back in August um, with some of our concerns around that. Many of the concerns are around smart and adaptive signals. Any signal timing changes should include a study of impacts on pedestrian safety and delay. So I'm all set. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for having us here and look forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, one brief question, but wanted to begin by thanking you both for your incredible work and advocacy, and, and I agree with virtually everything you said, not the least of which is a important under sort of subtext of this hearing was the fact that as a city we need to do a tremendously better effort going forward as it relates to the safety uh, of pedestrian, of cyclists, of people using multi-mode. So I appreciate that and agree with it wholeheartedly. Um, Stacy, you mentioned the Louisville model is sort of a good mm -hmm. uh, dynamic fleet. I think, yep. what was their number? Do you know offhand? Um, I can't remember. I, they're starting with a relatively small model. Yeah. Um, I would echo the comments of Lyft actually saying that some of these small, um, small pilots are concentrated in wealth communities yeah. and so I wouldn't necessarily do that but their dynamic pricing I mean dynamic model had to do with the number of uses per day and they require that that data coming back to the city monthly so that they can shift the size of the fleet based on that that's very interesting so so, so my, my inclination was that the the um, uh, the cap would be number of scooters this is actually about number of trips yeah, the number of scooters is determined by the number of trips. So, for example, if you see a scooter and it's being used five times a day, then that probably means you need another scooter on the gotcha. ground. If it's using let, being used like 0.8 times, maybe once every other day, um, then it probably means you need fewer scooters. So they okay. use the sort of number of trips to determine the number of scooters. Okay, good. And then um, is it sort of... Th did you have any concern, either of you have any concern as it relates to the speed that seems to be about 15, 14 miles an hour? Do you think 12 is better? Do you think it's, it's safe? It's, is it something that other cities have done? Do either of you know? I have um, strong opinions. These are partially Stacey Thompson, but also Liberal Streets uh, Alliance opinions. Um, I would say that I think that the speed of various options need to be needs to be met by infrastructure, and that the questions of 12 versus 15 miles an hour are immaterial if people are compelled to put those scooters on sidewalks. Um, and uh, you know. We also have a lot of questions around speed with automotives and like very large vehicles that are going 40, 50, 60 miles an hour on city streets. Um, so I, I think somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 miles an hour is an appropriate level to regulate these if we assume that they will be in bike lanes, but that it is only a small piece of the conversation we have to have around better regulating the speed of all of the vehicles on our streets currently. Okay, that, yeah, I please. agree. I Incredibly context sensitive. Okay, yeah. so. fair point. Then uh, that's, you guys both that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and then finally, and, and you both sort of addressed this, but I guess what aspects of regulation do you think should be done at the city level versus the state level? Because this is sort of another um, issue that we have to address going forward. So, do either of you want to jump in on that? Great. Um, so what I would like to see is at the state level a uh, freeing up of regulation and that if this makes sense, I would love the state to say um, municipalities and regions have more control over the different types of mobility options that are happening on their streets. And I think that that's the direction that all of our municipal partners are thinking as well. And that um, the actual use on our streets and the 
the partnership and all the things that we think about in um, sort of like our motivate contract are what the city should do. Um, I would say um, I think it's a good model to be working with our partners and it's imperative that we do so because it's going to be confusing if something different is happening in Cambridge and something different is happening in Everett. Um, but at the same time, I think we need to be thinking about our, um, like what is the role of our regional partners, um, MAPC, what is the role of the T, are they involved in these conversations, and then what is the role of MassDOT? So it's not an easy answer, it's just um, I think it's uh, all and, and that we need to have a strong seat at the table. Good, appreciate that. I, I agree with that, and I, I just moved to Watertown, and if I, so I took the bus in this morning, and then took the red line. I went through Watertown, a small sliver of Belmont, Cambridge, crossing DCR property, crossing, you know, MassDOT property. So it needs to be a re regional solution because the way people move around in the greater Boston area mm -hmm. is in a regional model, crossing many different jurisdictions. Yeah. No, fair point. I appreciate that both. Um, that's all I have for now, Madam Chair. Thank you both for your incredible work. Thank you. Um, yeah, spring is is. I'm, I'm eager, I'm excited, but spring feels like a lot of things have to come together uh, all, all at once. What would you say is your sort of biggest uh, wish or you know, on your, your list of goals of other things that are not directly related to this that the city has to tackle for this to work by the pilot? I love that you asked that question because I had one note here that I didn't hit on. It's that Portland, Oregon has two and a half full-time staff working on their scooter pilot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, is this the highest need right now? I, I'm unsure if that's the case. Um, there are a lot of other issues just within the realm of transportation. Mm -hmm. um, we've had five pedestrians hit and killed in the city uh, this year. Two of them were in their 80s. Um, so, you know, traffic safety and slowing vehicles down mm -hmm is huge priority. Does this move Vision Zero forward? Perhaps by switching more people to sustainable modes. Um, yeah, I would echo that and say, um, thinking real time, um, as you know, you guys um, supported a $5 million increase in the operations budget for the transportation department so that they could hire 20 staff. I would say that is paramount to us getting through so many other things. You know, um, we've talked about all these things that need to happen. We still only have a Stephanie Seskin, who I am confident will create the, the most comprehensive, if not best, policy in the country because that's her style. Um, but she also needs to deploy, um, in a matter of weeks, additional bike infrastructure. That is work that our public works folks need to do. There's this whole, you know, get it in the ground before Thanksgiving, before we get a freeze mentality. And I would say, if we want to save lives, that is more important to me than deploying in April versus deploying in June, July, or August. Um, and, and I would say um, some of the more structural reform questions will make or break the success of a pilot. So if we could, you know, get an update on where the hiring is and what that structure will look like and how it will um, uh, imp positively impact these deployments in 2019, I think that would be fantastic. And a game plan for what will be concretely implemented in terms of parking reform in 2019 will set us up for success in the spring. Great. Well, thank you both. Uh, really appreciate your time and your advocacy on so many issues. Um, is there anyone else in the chamber who would like to testify before we wrap up for a 2 p.m. hearing? <laughs> hearing none. Uh, final remarks, Councilor O'Malley? Just very briefly, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for your great uh, leadership and uh, partnership on this. Thank you to our, all of our panels. This was one of the most, um, I think, substantive hearings that we've done, certainly as it relates to micromobility, but this was also uh, a very worthwhile hearing for me because I think we covered a lot of topics, we discussed a lot of issues, and we were very frank and honest about challenges as well as benefits that lie ahead. This is a complex issue, but nevertheless, this is one that I feel very, very strongly we ought to be having, we ought to have, uh, be discussing. I'm very excited about the remarks from uh, the commissioners and the chief uh, and the director as it relates to uh, having a piloted program this spring. It's something that I feel very strongly we should be doing, and I'm really looking forward to making sure we do it well, we do it right, we do it effectively. So we sit here ready to work uh, with all stakeholders as we go forward and looking forward to seeing this uh, come to fruition uh, in the months ahead. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership, Councilor Malley, and your partnership.
This will conclude our hearing on docket number 1169, order for hearing on dockless mobility and electric scooters.